Hi, everyone, and a warm welcome. We're just going to give everyone uh, just a few more seconds to drop in and we'll get started. Okay, I think we can get started. I uh, I hope that everyone can hear and, and see everything uh, okay. Um, I'm in Europe, so I'll just go ahead and wish you a good morning. But if you're joining from elsewhere, good afternoon, evening, or perhaps night to you. We're so very glad that you could join us today. Thank you for being here. My name is Emilia Dungel, and I'm the chairperson of the Association in Memory of Joachim Dungel. The association was founded in 2012 to continue the work of my brother Joachim. He was an alumnus of Gothenburg University as well as NYU, and he was killed while working as a human rights officer for the UN in Afghanistan in 2011. We continue his work by hosting seminars to analyze complicated and often delicate topics related to international justice. International law is our framework and the notion that progress comes from dialogue and discussion is our foundation. Previous seminar topics include sexual violence and conflict, non-state actor recruitment of voluntary fighters, weapons of mass destruction, environmental justice, conventional weapons, and polarized societies, just to name a few. Many of these are available as recordings on the association's uh, website, so feel free to have a look. and We can share a link in the chat window later. This year is the 11th edition of the Joachim Dungel Lectures in International Justice, and we will focus on Afghanistan. Given the rather abrupt series of events that unfolded in and about the country during the second half of 2021, we want to take a look back at the various interventions in the country and see how these can or may influence international law, state building, and interventionist measures in the future. I will share my screen for just a quick moment to give you an overview of the sessions. Okay. Let me see if this works. Uh, the first session will focus on getting an overview of how to relate the war on terror to international law, especially as it relates to Afghanistan. We will then take a 15 minute break before turning to state building in Afghanistan, looking at it from international, national and local perspectives. Finally, we will conclude with, uh, with a panel discussion. Okay, great. We are so very grateful for our esteemed speakers um, these include, or are, Richard Bennett, who's a human rights expert <clears throat> and practitioner with vast experience in many countries, including Afghanistan. Sari Kovu, seconded national expert at the European External Action Service, an associate professor at the Department of Law at Gothenburg University. Sari is also one of the main organizers of these seminars. Esan Kane, researcher at the Afghanistan Analysts Network. Najiba Sanjar, consultant at the Urgent Action Fund for Women Human Rights at Asia and Pacific, former head of the Talukan Management Office at Swedish Committee for Afghanistan, and uh, I apologize for my pronunciation, uh, Torbjörn Pettersson, director of uh, the Department for Human Resources and Communications at the Swedish International Development Agency, SIDA. Thank you so much for being here. It is both an honor and a pleasure to have you. We're almost ready to start. Allow me just to go through some quick housekeeping before we get going. This webinar is in English and uh, we're not providing um, translation, unfortunately. As audience members, your mics and cameras are automatically off. We encourage you to ask questions by using the chat function at the bottom of your screen and we'll collect questions as we go and we'll do our best to get to as many as we can. And there will be question sessions at both uh, at the end of both sessions, as well as this uh, panel discussion towards the end. We are recording this webinar and we're gonna put it online at some point in the coming weeks, uh, once we've had a chance to, to subtitle it. As mentioned, there will be a break planned from 10.20 uh, to 10.35 European time, uh, Central European time. Um, of course, you're welcome to hop in and out of the sessions as suits your schedule by using the same link with which you entered the webinar now. Um, 
Just to mention that uh, Niels Krabbe, researcher at the Department of Law at Gothenburg University, Sari Kobu and myself will take turns facilitating the sessions. And on behalf of the association, I want to extend our warmest gratitude to both Sari Niels, Sari and Niels, as well as Maria Oninge and Jeffrey Johns and the seminar advisory committee. This would very literally not be possible without you. And again, thank you, our attendees. There are many of you here and we're very, very happy to see all of you here. We hope you find this discussion uh, stimulating and that it inspires you to continue talking about these issues uh, long after the webinar ends. So let's get started. I'm very happy to give the floor to Niels Krabbe. Niels, mm -hmm. over to you. Thank you very much, Emilia. So it's my privilege to chair this first session, which is titled Afghanistan and Beyond, Situating Two Decades of War on Terror Interventions. Uh, we will hear three presentations by Sari Kubo and Isan Kane and, and Richard Bennett, who have already been introduced, uh, and they will talk for about 15 minutes each. And then at 10.05, uh, roughly, we will uh, let the audience in to ask uh, questions and, and as Emilia said you will be able to ask questions using the chat function uh, and the session will end around 10 20. Um, and without further ado I, I will leave the word to Sari Kubo who will try to set the stage here uh, <laughs> with a presentation titled Afghanistan the war on terror and international law. Welcome Sari. Thank you very much I think I've has promised to do a little bit too much in 15 minutes, but let me start by trying to share my presentation. Yeah, see, it starts very well, doesn't it? That's it. Okay. Now, can you see my presentation? Perfect. Yes. So thank you very much for being here today. And it's always a pleasure to talk at these Joachim Dungel Lectures of International Law. I like the fact that what we try to do every year is to take a very practical approach to very real and complicated problems of international law and politics and also that there's this effort to always look at international law in its context, including with a political perspective and with what actually matters for people. It's a particular pleasure, obviously, to talk about, to, uh, be a, to talk at this seminar that's focused on Afghanistan, because I've had the, the luxury of being involved with Afghanistan for the most part of the past 15 years. And I think it's a country that definitely merits attention, both for its own sake, but also for how the conflict and the interne international invention in Afghanistan has impacted international law and politics. So my job here today is to try to set the stage and what I'll, how I'll do that is to first say a little bit about Afghanistan, why we talk about it, then look at, say a few words about why the US war on terror was fought in Afghanistan and why the Taliban are back in power today. And then I'll try to pull this together by looking at how, how the conflict and the past 20 years intervention in Afghanistan has impacted international law and politics. So let's start with why focus on Afghanistan. If I manage to change my screen. No, I don't manage to change my screen. Then let's do it another way. Let's stop sharing and let's talk. So why talk about Afghanistan? I think um, what, 
let's first situate Afghanistan. It's a landlocked country at the crossroads between cent Central and South Asia. It's a multi-ethnic country and a sparsely populated one. One might even say that it's a country that's pushed apart by climate and geography. Basically, it's quite hard to travel around Afghanistan certain parts of the year. Much of what we hear about Afghanistan in the news is uh, quite depressing, uh, sometimes quite scary, and it often gives the impression that nothing good's come out of Afghanistan. So I think it is important to say that it's also a country of country and people of great beauty, natural beauty, and also very exciting history, politics, and a fascinating culture. I've learned a lot about family, community, and also humanity over the years that I've spent in Afghanistan. However, Afghanistan as a country has had the misfortune of being a pawn in quite a few of the geopolitical battles over the past decades. Now, one can't, uh, it would be wrong to blame the conflict that conflicts that Afghanistan has had since the late 70s on its neighbors or on the international community, but it's certainly the case that how neighbors and the international community has engaged in Afghanistan, has been part of uh, sort of keeping the conflict going. And that also brings, brings us to one of the sort of the third reason why I think it is important that we talk about Afghanistan. And that is the fact that we have many competing crises in the world today. Currently working for the European External Action Service, I focus on the Sahel, uh, Sahel region in, Af Af in Africa, where we also can see quite in many ways similar conflicts as the one that we, we've seen in Afghanistan. We, uh, many of us have certainly been glued to news over the past, uh, past months following the sort of buildup of the conflict, potential conflict between, between Ukraine and Russia. So looking at this world turning into crisis mode, I think it is extremely important that we look at, okay, what are the tools that we are using to engage in conflicts and crisis situations? Do they work? And if they don't, what can we do, do about them? So a few words about what has happened in Afghanistan, focusing especially on the past 20 years. So the past, so the, basically the war on terror decades. Afghanistan has been in conflict since the late 1970s. I think for many of the students in this seminar, that's well before they were born. But uh, so the, the conflict, the modern conflict in Afghanistan started with a communist coup in 1978, a coup that worried the Soviet Union that then had a border with, a northern border with Afghanistan. It resulted in um, the Soviet Union occupying or intervening in the conflict 1979 and staying in Afghanistan as an occupying force for the most, most part of the 1980s. This was in the middle of the Cold War. So it was also an opportunity for the United States to, uh, to how should you say it, annoy its enemy by uh, providing funding and weapons to the Afghan resistance inside Afghanistan, fighting this Soviet occupation. It was a pretty dodgy resistance and a resistance that didn't really get along uh, with each other, that ended up being extremely empowered 
during this occupation because of the funding and the weapons coming in. 1989, the Soviets leave Afghanistan. Uh, we have a fragile government being set, set up and uh, a couple of years of relative peace before a new phase of the civil war starts. And it's in this new phase, it's from this new phase that the Taliban movement of the 1990s emerged and the Taliban slowly uh, in the mid, slowly during the 1990s, take more or less full power in Afghanistan, not completely. The Taliban govern, government was never recognized by most of the international community. It was one of these uh, paria nations that uh, uh, didn't become part of the sort of internet international community, largely because of the very discriminatory practices used by the Taliban government towards women, but also towards different religious and ethnic minorities. The fact that it wasn't recognized or uh, uh, one, of the, uh, one of the consequences of it not being recognized was that it also provided then a safe haven for terrorist groups like Al-Qaeda. The attacks, and now we move on to the past 20 years, the attacks on the Twin Towers in New York and on Pentagon in, on September 11, 2001, were not planned and administered by the Taliban but it was generally held that they were planned by Al-Qaeda from inside Afghanistan. So in this sort of crisis mode, immediately after the, the attack, it, the US decided to, to attack Afghanistan using a self-defense argument. As most who are in this, pan, this uh, seminar today know, there's a general prohibition against the use of force in international law, but there are some exceptions, including the exceptions of self-defense. The self-defense argument, even if the Taliban weren't the uh, sort of, hadn't planned the attack, attack were, was largely accepted by the international community, including by the US's military allies in NATO. This meant that when the US went into Afghanistan, the international community followed. Now, while the self-defense argument, or as the self-defense argument was largely accepted, most part, parts of the international community ended up also tacitly accepting quite a few of the mechanisms that the US put in place on uh, as part of the international war on terror. Although there were sort of outcries, obviously, against some of these policies, uh, there wasn't a very clear, no, we're not going to be part of this. And over oh, particularly the first years of the US intervention in Afghanistan when the war on terror was really being fought, uh, we saw massive amounts of illegal detention. We saw massive amounts of torture-like practices being used. Some of these resulted in uh, people sort of deaths in custody. And these practices were used systematically and largely also as, as part of the war on terror policy. Uh, one of the consequences of this, of the way the US war on terror was fought in Afghanistan was that we ended up having two parallel processes in Afghanistan in the years 2002 and onwards. On the one hand, 
and the quite short-sighted, very violent and brutal war on terror that also demanded that, um, that also ended up meant empowering some quite dodgy figures inside Afghanistan. And on the other hand, the sort of UN supported uh, international state building process that was to bring democracy, a human rights centered constitution and development into Afghanistan. These two projects married, married very uneasily and it is, was almost impossible to build a nation without a proper peace process when these two projects were ongoing. So as uh, my former boss, the US Special Representative for Afghanistan used to say, it's extremely easy to start a war. It's almost impossible to end one. And uh, the US war on terror certainly kept a war going in Afghanistan. One that actually ended up becoming worse and worse with the years. The US stayed in Afghanistan for, together with the international community, for the most parts of 20 years. Since around 2014, there was efforts to sort of pull out of Afghanistan, but, um, but it's only during the Trump administration that there was a real sort of cutoff period saying, now we need to get out of, out of Afghanistan and the US, US Special Envoy, Envoy to Afghanistan was, was asked to, to make a peace deal at almost any costs. This resulted, and now we sort of close up to the events of last August, it resulted in the US first doing a bilateral peace agreement with the, the Taliban that enabled them to withdraw. But as a condition of that peace deal, there should be a peace deal between the Taliban and the Afghan government. This uh, considerably weak, considerably empowered the Taliban and weakened the Afghan government's negotiation position. And the consequences of that are, are evident. It subsequently resulted in the fall of the Afghan government and a Taliban take. Now, I don't think that we can, and I'll turn to international law in just a minute. I don't think that we can blame the, uh, can blame the sort of last August, August events entirely on the US withdrawal, but it's important to, uh, the Afghan government has certainly uh, could probably have done more and uh, had probably over the years uh, catered a little bit too much to its international allies and a little bit too little towards actually trying to build peace in Afghanistan. So what's the, how has, looking at the past 20 years, what's happened in, with international law. A couple of points that I think are very important to have, have with us for this day. Well, as I said, the self-defense argument for intervening in Afghanistan was pretty well accepted. At the same time, the consequence of the massive military engagement in Afghanistan has uh, somehow eroded the notion of there being a prohibition against the use of force in international law. So we've opened up a space for military interventions. And there's a lot of economic interest, political and economic interest in military style interventions. And this has been a sort of transition over the past few decades. Uh, another consequence, there's um, traditionally international human rights, international humanitarian law recognizes two types of conflicts, uh, international 
armed, international armed co conflicts and non-international armed conflicts. What we've seen over the past decades is an increase in what some authors called internationalized armed, national armed conflicts. So situations where government, governments fight insurgency, but with a considerable international presence. These internationalized armed conflicts have created a new dynamic. One opened up for new actors, including, including security companies, mercenaries, but also changed some of the policies of how wars are fought and resulted in a decreased protection of civilians in certain conflict situations. Uh, they made wars quite uh, much more brutal. I think there's a, there's a, we'll talk quite a lot about human rights here today, but I think what has also happened over the past decades is that, well, there is actually much more talk about human rights today and much more talk about women's rights today and also women, peace and security than maybe a few decades back. But uh, the Human Rights Project has become very much embedded in the, in the uh, securitized international law project. There is no real critical outside anymore that, that can sort of look in and uh, question and push at the very securitized agenda. Uh, we could also talk, uh, uh, talk about the changes to international criminal law. The International Criminal Court has uh, developed during the same years as did the sort of, uh, as did the conflict in Afghanistan and uh, the presence, the sort of, the US positioning vis-a-vis -vis the International Criminal Court, including in the case of Afghanistan, has also had an impact on how international criminal law and transitional justice has evolved. I'm gonna start, I'm gonna uh, not, I'm gonna sort of not talk about international refugee law here, but I think that's another area that one could look at in much more detail. Uh, so lessons from Afghanistan, what should we take with us? Well, geopolitics affects international politics and law. It affects international law in very real ways. Countering violent extremism and terrorism and the securitization of international politics and law is a, a real, has resulted in policies and legal changes that we need to be extremely attentive about. Uh, we do see a very clear marginalization of human rights law and humanitarian law. And I think it makes sense to have a very critical look at the toolbox that we are using in international interventions. So thank you. And sorry for the PowerPoint problems. No worries. And thank you very much, Sari. Thank you for a very interesting presentation, a very thought evoking. And we'll actually continue now uh, on uh, sort of looking into the connection between the Afghanistan case and, and international law. Uh, and I'll invite uh, Isan Kane uh, to present. Uh, and Ethan, and your presentation is, is titled Discussing the Transition, the Taliban Takeover and International Law. So this will sort of bring what Sori talked about into a more contemporary context and, and connect to more recent events. So please, Ethan, the floor is yours. Thank you so much, uh, Niels. Good morning. Uh, as Niels uh, already introduced me, uh, my name is Ehsan Kane. It is uh, almost a decade I have worked as a researcher with Afghanistan Analyst Network, a policy research organization focused on Afghanistan issues. 
It is a pleasure to be here today. Thank you, Gothenburg University, especially Dr. Sarikovo and Association in Memory of uh, Joachim Dengo for invi uh, inviting me uh, to this uh, here, uh, uh, webinar. Using the opportunity, I'm sharing a few thoughts about uh, uh, the Taliban new government uh, recognition and the international law, situation of Afghanistan embassies and uh, residences around the globe since the uh, uh, fall of the uh, former Afghan regime, and finally, legal responsibilities of withdrawal from Afghanistan, talking about the legal responsibility of the international community who have been involved in the Afghanistan conflict. And also, as Sari mentioned, the uh, uh, nation and peace building in Afghanistan after 2001. <clears throat> so starting from the first point, recognition of the new Taliban government and the international law. Uh, as you may know, recognition or non-recognition of a government is uh, more a political decision rather than legal. But for sure, the decision has uh, many legal implications, including, uh, but not limited to representations of a state in international organizations and community, uh, 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 as well as the question of uh, legal duties of uh, a recognized state in absence of a lawful government. Uh, we should also understand that recognition of a government is a different concept from recognition of a state. The government is an essential element of a statehood. Afghanistan, for example, I can say, Afghanistan is a recognized state and a member of the United Nations, regardless of its current dilemma rooted to the regime change on 15 August, 2021. Uh, Non-recognition of the Taliban de facto government as the leg legitimate uh, ruler of Afghanistan does not impact this fact or the Afghanistan commitments to the international treaties and conventions. Vice versa, it, it does not uh, also affect the Afghanistan rights under the international law. When I'm saying Afghanistan here, I mean the Afghanistan as a state, as a country. <clears throat> uh, uh, the international law principles related to the recognition of a new state uh, do not necessarily apply on recognition, recognition of a new government. Changing of governments is a common political practice. However, when the change happens in a way different to what defined in a domestic law of a state, uh, for example, through a coup d'etat, revolution, or in Afghanistan case, uh, insurgency, Recognition of such a new government become a subject to its recognition by the other uh, countries and international state organizations. Uh, in this regards, at least we can say two doctrines uh, have been emerged uh, in the last century, in the uh, 20th century. The first one is uh, Tobar doctrine, also known as uh, Wilsonian policy, which was defined in the beginning of uh, last century by Carlos Tebor, Minister of Foreign Affairs of Ecuador by then. It says government taking power from unconstitutional way should not be granted recognition. The second one is Estrada, which was created in 1930 by Gen uh, Gennaro Estrada. I'm not sure if uh, I'm really uh, pronouncing this, the, this, the, these names correctly because uh, they are uh, Spanish, I believe. Uh, Mexican, uh, Estrada was Mexican Secretary of Foreign Affairs by then. Uh, the doctrine says that the creation of a new government should be based uh, on its de facto extents rather uh, than on its legitimacy. This policy based on the principle of non-intervention and self-determination of all nations, which does not allow the states to assess the legit, uh, legitimacy of governments of one another. In relation to the Taliban government, the Taliban de facto government, it seems that the international community and the UN followed the Tobar doctrine. No state and no international organizations, including the UN has recognized the Taliban government as the Taliban uh, took, uh, uh, took uh, power through almost uh, 20 year insurgency using force, and violence. Uh, discussions 
are ongoing about the recognition of the Taliban government. Uh, uh, from this discussion, two conditions, at least uh, I can say, have been uh, raised by the states and uh, by the international community that the Taliban should fulfill before being recognized by, uh, by, by them or by the international uh, uh, community. The first one is, the first condition is to establish an inclusive government with a broad foundation. Uh, though the term has not been the term of inclusive government, has not been well defined by the gen, uh, 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 by, by, by uh, the international community and also by, uh, by the Afghan uh, parties. However, generally it means uh, they should include representatives of the other ethnicities. Uh, the Taliban government is majority uh, by uh, uh, Pashtun ethnicity. But of course, they have also some Uzbeks and Tajiks. And recently, they also uh, uh, appointed two uh, Hazaras. These are the name of uh, uh, four major uh, uh, ethnicities living here in Afghanistan. But of course, there are some more minors, uh, minor uh, uh, ethnicity groups there. <clears throat> so uh, it should, uh, it means uh, uh, the Taliban should uh, include representatives of uh, other ethnicities, women, and political parties, as well as to establish a mechanism to ensure the inclusivity in the future. To reach to this purpose, a roadmap has been designed by the Afghan civil society uh, figures and independent, some independent uh, political uh, uh, persons. Uh, this roadmap was given to the Taliban delegation who visited Oslo in January this year. Uh, Actually, the roadmap suggests a very similar model of 2001 Bonn Conference on Afghanistan. A political process must be started by holding a Loi Jirga. Loi Jirga is an Afghan traditional assembly of elders, uh, uh, which was also somehow recognized in the 2004 Afghan constitution uh, when it is, uh, when there are decision, big decision about the national interest, including the amendment of the constitution, uh, uh, and Loi Jirga or Assembly of Elders should come together and decide about that. However, this Loi Jirga, which is uh, suggested in the roadmap, does not mean that that does not mean that uh, constitu uh, cons uh, constitutional Loi Jirga. It means uh, it, it is referring to the traditional uh, form of the uh, Loi Jirga or Assembly of Elders. So this Assembly of Elders or Loi Jirga. Uh, should uh, establish an interim government as the first step. Then adopting uh, a new constitution in which an election mechanism must be defined to elect new government. Finally, organizing of uh, election as the last step is uh, foreseen in the, in the roadmap. The Taliban have not replied to this roadmap yet. And uh, we don't know uh, how much this roadmap has the international community support. But uh, in terms of the inclusivity of the government, it is uh, how exactly uh, uh, reflected in the, in the roadmap. The second condition has been brought before the Taliban by the international government is, uh, international community is that the Taliban must fulfill the Afghanistan international duties and commitments. It includes to respect human rights conventions, the human rights of uh, women to education, work and health is included. Afghanistan at least signed seven UN conventions on human rights with no objections. The Taliban actions and policies looks like they are not willing to fulfill these, ob these obligations. In the last six months, under the international community pressure, <coughs> uh, Taliban compromised their restriction, at least their restriction, restricted policy on girls' right to education conditionally. Uh, these days, uh, when I'm uh, watching news and reading reports, they are saying that Taliban agreed to allow girls going to school and university soon, maybe in, uh, in next month or in two next months. Uh, the, Talib the Taliban requested the UN uh, to recognize their government and allow them to send their permanent representatives to the UN. The UN Credential Committee deferred the request in early December. To be honest, I don't know the committee's legal arguments and why they rejected the Taliban uh, request. But uh, as uh, uh, I believe it, it, it should be somehow a kind of a political decision then 
rather than a, a legal decision. Uh, though there is uh, a con consensus among every relevant international entities on no recognition of the Taliban unless they accept the conditions. It could not mean, however, that the relation of these entities are completely cut with the Taliban. Taliban have uh, been invited to participate conferences or meetings out of Afghanistan. For instance, uh, the Organization for Islamic Cooperation, OIC, had invited the Taliban Acting Minister for Foreign Affairs to his conference in Islamabad last year. I think it was November. It was November. The Taliban delegation traveled to a few countries, including Norway, which was happened last month in January, and, and, and into Suez, which happened at the early of this month, Feb, February, to meet the uh, official uh, to meet the official of these two uh, countries. Some countries, including Iran, Pakistan, China, and Russia, have kept their uh, embassies open in Afghanistan after the Taliban returned. Or in, a, in other words, they have never closed their embassies in Afghanistan, though the regime has been changed. And they uh, kept their uh, relationship with the Taliban de facto government in a, a way that could uh, benefit their national interest. And of course, the, it was also a, a good uh, uh, a good step for the Taliban to, to have them in, in Afghanistan. Uh, reports reveal that Iran and Pakistan coordinate the Afghanistan embassies in their countries with the Taliban Ministry of Foreign Affairs. Uh, the Taliban Foreign Minister have, uh, have visited uh, Pakistan and Iran separately. And they also, uh, the news also says that uh, uh, the, the minister appointed some, some people in these embassies in consent of the, uh, the host countries. And you also may know that the uh, EU also reopened its political office in Kabul. So uh, though the international community and the uh, state uh, uh, have not recognized the Taliban de facto government, but they, kept, uh, they have uh, kept their relationship uh, open with, with the Taliban de facto government in some extent. Uh, the second point I would like to uh, uh, talk about is, uh, is uh, about the situation of Afghan embassies and residents around the world after the regime change. Uh, I would like to go very quickly about this because I don't like to uh, take the uh, Richard Bannis time. Uh, I would like to hear his excellent uh, insight, uh, insight and views. I'm sure uh, he has much more better information and analysis uh, uh, compared to me. Uh, so the situation of Afghanistan embassies and residents uh, in different countries uh, are uh, uh, quite similar to each other, except in China, Afghanistan embassies and residents are operating in the other countries. Uh, the embassy in China, the Afghanistan embassy in China uh, did not survive to due to the shortage of financial uh, 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 resources. With no exception, other embassies are going through the same hardship. Uh, we are Afghanistan on its embassies and residence building, like the Netherlands, the, condition, the condition, uh, conditions are better. Afghanistan ambassador to the US just resigned last week from her position. Almost every Afghan embassy lost a few of their staff as the, as the embassy embassies were not able to pay them. In many cases, their only source of income is the fee receiving in exchange of providing services to the Afghan, uh, Afghan citizen in, in the host countries. Services including like issuing passports or marriage certificates and other legal documents. <clears throat> Except for Pakistan, we have the Taliban changed the staff of the embassy and consulate or ask the remaining staff to work under the Taliban administration. The other embassies and residences are in place as they were and still represent the Republic of uh, Afghan, uh, Republic Islamic of Afghanistan, the, the former regime. The host countries are also dealing with them as they are still representing the former government. I'm in contact with some Afghan diplomats in some countries. So okay, these are coming from uh, my own uh, sources. Uh, from the Afghan embassies. Uh, not sure if uh, it, uh, there would be any public information about this. Uh, 
related to the UN, uh, the UN uh, Credential Committee agreed to keep the seat of the Islamic Republic of Afghanistan for the present. Before coming to this decision, there was a big concern among Afghan diplomats working in the Afghan embassies about revoking uh, the current seat of Afghanistan in the UN. If the committee decided to revoke the uh, to revoke the Afghanistan seat in the UN, uh, that could also mean that all the Afghan embassies representing the former government must be closed down. Uh, don't have uh, really legal arguments, but I think uh, till the former regime seat is secured in the UN, this embassy would also stay open in countries if they survive the financial difficulties they face in the host country, if, and also if the host countries do not decide otherwise. In the beginning of February, at uh, the, the latest Afghan Republic Minister for Foreign Affairs, wrote to the UN to replace the Afghan permanent representatives to the UN. The UN, however, rejected his request. I don't know the arguments, but his, this could mean that the UN recognize, do not recognize the former regime as the a de jure government either. Keeping the Afghan uh, uh, PR in the UN and embassies in the host countries is a political decision, decision rather illegal, as uh, I believe. Uh, and uh, as not recognizing, it is as, uh, as political as uh, they are not recognizing the Taliban de facto government. Uh, so it, is a, it was a general picture of the, uh, how Afghan embassies and residents are right now in different countries and uh, how much uh, they are, their presence or uh, the dealing, the, they are dealing or other dealing with them or based on the international law or based on the political uh, relationship. Uh, related to the withdrawal of uh, uh, international community from the Afghanistan and the possible legal responsibilities they, 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 they would have uh, uh, related to Afghanistan, I would like to say some very short uh, bullet points and uh, would be much happy if there would be any question to answer them later. So I believe there, there, there are uh, at least these uh, three legal uh, responsibilities for, the, for those who withdraw Afghanistan and who fought in Afghanistan. Uh, the first thing is during the war, as Sadi also mentioned, uh, many uh, human rights violations, including international crimes like uh, torture uh, as a war crimes and also as a crime against humanity or court uh, in Afghanistan. And uh, based on the uh, preliminary investigation of the ICC, International Criminal Court, at least the US uh, Army and uh, CIA have been uh, allegedly involved in commission of torture and sexual harassment uh, 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 in the early uh, year after they intervened it, uh, into Afghanistan. Uh, uh, I believe it is the responsibility of the US to uh, not leave the victims of their crimes uh, and uh, violation without repression. They have a legal obligation to, to repair the damage uh, they, they caused to the victims uh, as individual and also as a, a, a collective, as a, as a, a community. Uh, and the second responsibility, which also uh, uh, mainly focused uh, on the US, uh, is about making sure that the Taliban and the other uh, terrorist group uh, uh, would not use the, uh, uh, the US weapons, uh, uh, which have been left in Afghanistan. And uh, they kill the innocent people by, by using those, those guns and weapons. Uh, I think it's really need serious uh, talks between the US and the Taliban de facto government and other uh, uh, stakeholders involved in Afghanistan to make sure that those weapons, which are really in terms of amount and in terms of uh, 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 technology, they are, uh, they are uh, very large and also uh, dangerous weapons. Uh, and the third would be, uh, still pushing the Taliban uh, to establish uh, an inclusive government and to fulfill the Afghanistan international obligation until the Taliban uh, do not compromise and uh, do not come to these uh, uh, conditions, the international community should avoid recognizing 
the Taliban de facto government. And finally, which could be, I'm not sure if it could be really legal, but I think it's really ethical and the responsibility of everyone, including uh, the, the, the countries in the state, is providing uh, uh, humanitarian aids for the Afghan people. After the uh, withdrawal of the international community from Afghanistan, the Afghanistan economy uh, has been collapsed and more than 90% of the Afghan population are living under poverty line. And they really need to uh, help from everyone, including the countries and states. I thank you very much uh, and would like to stop here. Well, thank you very much, Ethan. Very interesting to listen to. Um, before I give the word to, to Richard Bennett, I'll, I'll just repeat that uh, you're all able to post questions using the chat function and, and, and please do. This is a very good opportunity to uh, to discuss these issues and ask questions you've been wondering about, uh, considering the experts we have with us. Um, so I'll now hand over the word to, to Richard Bennett, who sort of bridge and 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 move forward from from what Ethan just discussed and try to look into the future uh, based on the current situation and and what may change for international human rights law uh, based on this this Afghanistan case. Uh, Please, Richard, we're so glad to have you with us. Um, thank you, Niels, for your introduction. Um, and it's a, a great uh, honor, pleasure to be with you. I, I'd like to begin by thanking also the, the organizers um, from the University of Gothenburg, especially Sari Kovo, um, and also um, the Association in Memory of Joachim Dungel. I didn't know Joachim. Um, but I also worked in UNAMA as a human rights officer um, at a different time, um, and, and therefore it's an honor to participate in, in this series um, uh, dedicated in Joachim's memory. Um, I, I'm going to begin by, by making a few kind of sweeping statements before I come to the subject. Um, uh, uh, following the withdrawal um, in August last year, Afghans feel abandoned uh, politically, militarily, economically, even socially. And they feel betrayed, um, not only, as Sari said, uh, by the US and its allies, but also by their own government. So they, there is a huge psychological impact uh, on Afghans, whether they are still in Afghanistan or have, have moved abroad, um, of what has happened, not only in the last six months, uh, but in the last 20 years. And I think it's important to, to take note um, of that, uh, bearing in mind both what Esan and Sari have said about the impact of the war on terror. Um, I think it's important from a human rights perspective to think about what lessons there are in this uh, uh, for others, indeed for us, um, if human rights are universal, are indivisible and interdependent and based on respect for the dignity and worth of every human being, um, that perhaps this should be a call to action. So I've said abandoned politically, military, economically, and socially, I didn't say that the human rights have been abandoned. And that's what I'd like to uh, discuss a bit more now. But before that, um, we're talking about the, uh, the impact of the war on, on, on terror. And perhaps we are now in the autumn of the war on terror. Unfortunately, we might also be about to enter the winter of a new cold war and even possibly a terrifying hot war. But it's, it seems likely that the door is shutting, not just on the post 9-11 epoch, 
but on the era of liberal interventionism uh, that began after the end of the previous Cold War. Uh, geographically, many factors drive this change, possibly towards a new darker era, um, but, but overall, um, is the, the, the twin poles of the ascendancy of China uh, in the international sphere and the decline of the US in the same sphere. Um, I'd like to speak uh, a bit about uh, the uh, changes for international human rights law um, uh, after two, two decades. Um, in fact, I doubt there will be many changes to the law itself. Um, but as Sari pointed out, uh, international human rights law has been influenced by the war on terror. And there may be consequences arising for what has taken place in Afghanistan and other places for how human rights is practiced and on international institutions and frameworks. Turning to the human rights situation now in Afghanistan, which uh, uh, Esan has already covered to some degree and very well, um, uh, when one kiss considers the way in which women are being treated, once again, in which disappearances, extrajudicial killings and torture are taking place, uh, freedom of expression and the media are being trampled, Dissent is prohibited. The space for civil society has shrunk. Children are exploited and minorities are excluded. It's clear that the human rights situation is dire. And the human current humanitarian crisis is also a human rights crisis. Uh, the UN predicts that 97% of Afghans will fall below the poverty line this year. And this is exacerbated, of course, by the financial crisis and the collapse of the banking system. There's a lack of cash and desperation as such that there are reports of, of, uh, of, of parents selling their children or people selling their organs. Um, uh, so desperate um, are they? So it is tempting to draw a conclusion uh, that not only uh, have Afghans been abandoned in other ways, but the human rights protection has been abandoned. It's worth noting that also that many uh, women and human rights defenders have left Afghanistan. Um, some continue to function in exile. The Afghanistan Independent Human Rights Commission can't function at present, although its members do remain officially in office, the institution has not been dissolved by the Taliban, so it's, it will be interesting to follow that. Uh, some human rights defenders have remained in Afghanistan and continue to protest bravely, especially women. I think it's fair to say that Afghan women are leading the resistance to the violation of human rights in Afghanistan. It's critical, therefore, that the light continues to be shone on the human rights situation. So what tools exist to protect human rights? How can they be brought to bear in the situation to halt and reverse this appalling deterioration? I'll speak mainly about the UN system. Um, as you're aware, and as Esan has uh, mentioned, Afghanistan's international human rights obligations continue um, uh, uh, because they're obligations of the state, um, whatever group uh, may be in power. Um, uh, and as also as Esan noted, Afghanistan has right ratified seven of the core international human rights treaties, uh, including the Convention on the Elim Elimination of Discrimination Against Women Without Reservation. Uh, and of course, it's a party to the Rome Statute. It's also on the agenda of the Human Rights Council, which held a special session at the end of August last year. Uh, and the High Commissioner for Human Rights is tasked with reporting regularly to the council. She's done so several times since the Taliban take takeover and will be uh, submitting two reports on Afghanistan at the forthcoming session of the council starting in a couple of weeks. Um, actually, I think starting in one week. Um, um, Importantly, 
uh, Afghanistan is on the agenda of the Security Council. Um, UNAMA is a spe special political mission. It's no, named. It's a, a type of, of uh, organization uh, that is mandated by the Human Rights Council, and it has quite a robust human rights mandate um, and a substantial human rights component, which continues to function hand in glove with OHCHR, the Office of the High Commissioner for Human Rights. And the head of uh, uh, that um, uh, unit represents the High Commissioner for Human Rights in Afghanistan, and is also a member of, of all the main uh, UN teams in Afghanistan, including the humanitarian team and the development team. So is able to bring a human rights lens to development and political as well as humanitarian concerns. Um, following the events of last August, um, the UN's mandate was rolled over for six months. It hasn't changed. It's expected to be renewed in mid-March. Um, uh, and in my view, uh, the Security Council uh, uh, should retain a, hum a strong human rights mandate and a full team on the ground in UNAMA. Uh, but we don't know about um, that yet. I noticed a chat. A question in the chat box about the position of China and, and Russia. Um, um, it, it, in general, um, they have not blocked um, um, uh, Security Council mandates on Afghanistan, um, but they have generally been uncomfortable with and sometimes opposed human rights elements of those mandates, and in particular, the expansion of human rights, whether it's the expansion of the mandate or the expansion of the resources. So it will be interesting to see in March um, what is decided by the Security Council and what, uh, what uh, uh, China and Russia may have to say about that. And um, the Security Council is also involved in monitoring the protection of child rights in Afghanistan um, through a, a resolution uh, um, which established global monitoring and reporting of uh, what are known as six grave violations um, against children in armed conflict. And this is also monitored um, uh, through uh, uh, the UN system, both UNAMA and UNICEF in this case, as well as NGOs in Afghanistan until now. Coming back to the Human Rights Council, I've mentioned the treaties that are um, uh, uh, monitored by treaty bodies. Um, and I want to mention some other uh, Human Rights Council mechanisms, especially this, what's known as the Special Procedures and the UPR. Um, the UPR is held every four year. That, that's the Universal Periodic Review. It's a peer review of the human rights situation in any country. Um, and uh, Afghanistan, so Afghanistan would be reviewed by other states. Afghanistan's participated in three cycles of this review, the most recent being in 2019. Um, it will be interesting to see uh, if uh, it participates next time around. Um, every state in the world has participated in the UPR so far, as far as I'm aware, um, including, for example, North Korea. So it will be interesting to see whether that mechanism uh, gains any traction. Uh, it's hard to know whether the treaty bodies, um, the treaties will do so. And then um, I think finally, the special procedures, what's known as special procedures are independent mandates that come cover a, a range of thematic and country issues. Um, and it's a long time since any of these mandate holders made an official visit to Afghanistan, but many of them have uh, continued to actively engage um, including sending official communications to uh, uh, the, the government and making public statements. And most recently in January, a large number of them uh, expressed alarm that Taliban leaders um, are institutionalizing large scale and systematic gender-based discrimination and violence against women and girls. And they said that taken together, these policies constitute a collective punishment of women and girls grounded on gender-based bias and harmful practices. They also express grave concern about egregious violations of the human rights of ethnic and religious minorities and of children. 
Um, the 48th session of the Human Rights Council last October, um, uh, the, it established a new mandate, a special rapporteur on the, on the situation of human rights uh, uh, in the uh, uh, situation of human rights in Afghanistan. Um, uh, this, uh, this person will be appointed at the forthcoming council session. Um, and just to be uh, transparent, I'm one of those the candidates for that post. So um, let's see what, uh, what happens there. Um, I've described some of the tools that exist to address, uh, to protect human rights in Afghanistan. The question is, are all these tools adequate and will they be effective? And the answer is not really known yet, but the signs are not terribly positive uh, at the moment. The, uh, uh, what is used, the, the term used de facto authorities for the Taliban um, regime um, has said little about human rights. Esan um, has, has, has noted um, uh, that uh, there are few, if any, signs that they will um, uh, meet their international human rights uh, obligations. Certainly their messaging is inconsistent and there's a, a gulf between their rhetoric and the reality of the ground on the ground. Some of their uh, spokesmen, they're all men of course, uh, say that they will respect human rights, but they always say within the context of Islamic law and Afghan traditions. So that is always a massive caveat. Uh, they're generally vague and they um, uh, uh, some have been a little bit more open um, um, uh, and others have stated quite directly um, that women are, uh, are not equal to men um, and that now that they've returned to power, uh, the Taliban doesn't need to accept criticism or, or dissent from others in Afghanistan. However, they do appear to crave recognition by the international community and we'll need to see whether that provides some kind of leverage. Between, prior to the Taliban uh, takeover, there were meetings with their political team in, in uh, Doha for several years in, uh, in which human rights were discussed um, by the UN. Um, uh, and I'm aware um, uh, from social media that uh, human rights issues have con been continued to be raised uh, by the de facto authorities, by UNAMA and by some diplomatic uh, authorities, diplomatic missions uh, after the uh, August 2021 20, takeover. Um, uh, Esan has already uh, mentioned the issue of uh, um, uh, recognition of the Taliban. He's covered that um, extremely thoroughly. Um, so I, I won't a comment except the fact that there's another country in the same boat almost as Afghanistan, which is Myanmar. And on the 1st of February last year, um, Myanmar, um, uh, there was a, a coup in Myanmar and a military junta uh, replaced an elected government. And it is also not recognized at the UN. These are the two states which are not, don't have recognized governments. The difference with Myanmar, however, is that they have set up um, an alternative government. Um, uh, that is um, a separate government in exile, which is claiming to represent the people and wants to take um, the seats um, at the UN and be recognized by the international community. That hasn't happened in the case of Afghanistan. Um, I think we're running out of time, so I'll skip over a few things. Um, Esan, of course, has, has, has covered the International Criminal Court. Um, I'd like to, so to just raise really, and for my colleagues to uh, shoot me down if they wish, um, uh, the, the, the question of whether the generalized treatment of women in Afghanistan um, might be of interest to the um, um, uh, International Criminal Court. Um, um, because it may uh, amount to a crime against humanity. The Rome Statute um, uh, says that a crime against humanity is, uh, uh, means one or more listed acts when committed as part of a widespread and systematic attack directed against any civilian population with knowledge of the attack. And, and some of these examples are murder and rape and torture and extermination, as you, as you all know, and also persecution. Um, where any identifiable group um, uh, 
is persecuted on political, racial, national, ethnic, cultural, religious, or gender and other grounds. Um, and uh, it, it, it means it's defined as the intentional and severe deprivation of fundamental rights contrary to international law by re re reason of the identity of the group or collectivity. So I'm raising a question here about the, um, uh, uh, the condition and the treatment of women in Afghanistan and whether it meets that uh, threshold. Some have, uh, uh, even in the 1990s actually, uh, the term gender apartheid um, was uh, used in relation uh, to the, um, uh, uh, the, the rules um, imposed on, on women in Afghanistan. Um, uh, the Rome Statute um, doesn't refer to gender apartheid, as, as you know, um, it, but it talks about acts, inhumane acts, in the, uh, in the context of an institutionalized regime of systematic oppression and domination by one racial group over another racial group. And I think there is some interest in exploring uh, the potential for interpreting uh, uh, this uh, as, being, as being possible to interpret it in law as uh, as opposed to being a political expression um, as it, it is um, at, at the moment. Now I, I'll, I'll wrap up, um, but I wanted just to, to um, finish off by talking about uh, consequences in other places for, um, uh, uh, for human rights arising from the situation. Uh, uh, in Afghanistan, and I'll do this due to shortage of time, just by asking a few questions rhetorically to see whether they may be interested in this. For example, does interventionism, uh, which I've said may be coming to an end, instrumentalize, has it instrumentalized a narrow version of human rights, a version that is linked to a certain view of freedom and democracy? My second question, where human rights are viewed as a top-down elitist imposition of the global north, who's responsible? And unless you do the hard work of showing that human rights corresponds to people's value systems and will lead them to a better life, then is it at all surprising that, uh, uh, that there is often this elitist view? Human rights are a beacon for oppressed people and sucker for the women's movement, especially in Afghanistan. So how can that be translated into real change? Um, uh, there's, there's little doubt that human rights are on the back foot compared with the century, uh, quarter century or so after the end of the Cold War. Uh, increases in polarization, authoritarianism, as well as the US-China dynamics that I've mentioned. But there's other issues, new issues for human rights, environmental issues has been mentioned, and technology places plays an in increasing role uh, for good and for bad, um, uh, be it um, uh, uh, allowing for uh, the, the monitoring of human rights or disinformation or um, uh, uh, the use of uh, drone warfare. Um, and Sari has also mentioned uh, the Sahel as another region, and, and she mentioned, uh, for example, um, uh, private security country companies and mercenaries, perhaps changing um, the uh, dynamics of the way in which conflict is fought and the protection of human rights becomes more difficult. And then finally, I think, um, uh, to note back to the UN, that, you, that large UN multidimensional peacekeeping operations are, la are largely winding down. There hasn't been a new one since 2014. Um, but there appears to be a move to more, towards more uh, lighter political missions, which still have uh, human rights components, but are smaller and don't have arms peacekeepers. So what does that say um, about the protection of human rights in countries that are experiencing conflict. Some might say that a light footprint is more, could be more successful um, than a heavy one. And um, I haven't made many references, but I'll finish with one. Um, uh, a, a paper written by Rory Stewart uh, in Foreign Affairs in the October and November edition last year uh, makes this case. Um, where to 
from for for inter international intervention and refers to Afghanistan as a the an example of the delusions of maximalism and argues for a me for a, a middle way a light and sustained footprint um, uh, noting that in the west politicians seem to swing from overreach and overstatement and to isolationism and withdrawal so I will, uh, I probably run over my allotted time, but I will stop there, Niels, thank you. That's fine, and thank you for a very interesting presentation. Uh, we now have a few minutes of question. I, I'll, I'll first let Richard capture his breath <laughs> a bit uh, and start off by, by asking Sari a question uh, from the chat. Um, so uh, the question was, how do you see uh, the unwilling and unable doctrine used by the Jew as to justify their use of force. And, and we should probably say then that uh, the unwilling and unable doctrine poses that a victim state has the right to engage in, in lawful extraterritorial self-defense when the host state is unwilling and, and or unable to mitigate or suppress the threat posed by domestic non-state actors. Uh, how do you see this uh, in the connection of, of, of the US intervention? Thank you very much. It's an interesting and it's a complicated question. So I'll take it from a quite a practical point of view. I mean, uh, many of uh, many of the sort of much of the audience here is students of international law, and we've learned that the principle of sovereignty is one of the sort of basic basic principles of international law, and that's also that's both. Uh, the principle of sovereignty is both then a stabilizing factor, we can say, in the international system, but it's also a, can be a ease in the sort of, can also be a stumbling block in the situations where governments have a complete disregard for their citizens. The whole discussion discussion about Afghanistan also partly comes back to that principle of sovereignty and as both as the stabilizing factor and the stumbling box. I think we've had we've seen in international law some some sort of strategies emerging that try to try to break up this principle. Multilateralism in, is partly part of that but uh, or and then we have the the sort of uh, the policy of the responsibility to protect and on the other side this uh, uh, the us policy on unable and unwilling personally i i do uh, uh, how should I say it? It is uh, obviously in situations where there is a direct attack by a certain group on a different territory, as was in the case in 9-11. Here you can sort of find legal, legal and very persuasive political arguments to su support that principle. However, it is also a policy that uh, has resulted in there being, a, a, how to say, a, oh yes, emergence between what is some situations where we have important Islamic violent insurgencies and the threat of international ter terrorism. And this, the link between national inter insurgencies and an actual threat to international peace and security, that's often, it's often quite, quite weak. And it's often a link that's being developed and completely played out in the political domain. So 
from a personal perspective, I think uh, broader acceptance of this policy would, cert would be very unfortunate in this moment of time when the threat of terrorism is sort of has so much political currency in the international in international politics thank you very much and and uh, I, I would really appreciate since we're running a bit short of time if everyone could be a bit short in 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 their response i, I have a question here from for isan i think uh, of course uh, others are also free to to intervene um it relates to uh, the, the the discussion you made on the potential recognition of the Taliban government. Uh, and the question says that, as I understand it, members from the Haqqani network have been put into leading positions of the Taliban takeover. Is it, it is difficult for me to fathom how such a regime can be recognized. What is your view? I mean, considering uh, the repetition and, and some of the values expressed uh, by members of the government. Uh, what's, what's your take on this season? Yeah, I think that's a very good, valid point. Uh, most of the Taliban uh, uh, acting cabinet members have been uh, largely involved in commission of uh, violations, including uh, those who raise at the level of international crimes including war crimes and crimes against humanity. And they are allegedly on the list of the International Criminal Court uh, uh, suspects, I believe. And some of them are on also on the uh, uh, sanction list of UN and some other states like the US. Uh, I think uh, uh, recognition of such a government would uh, not only put Afghanistan in a bad shape, uh, it would also encourage other or similar terrorist groups to uh, do insurgency or carry uh, credit against the uh, 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 lawful government and took uh, the power. And it, it is a really bad practice would uh, uh, hugely, at least uh, uh, when we are talking about the principles, would hugely impact the, uh, the uh, international order and peace. And uh, when it comes to uh, Afghanistan, uh, I believe uh, there are a majority of Afghans who are not happy with, with the uh, Taliban government, uh, especially with, with those who are now in, in, in power, uh, mainly from the Hakan network. You know, Hakan network is a part of the Taliban when you're talking. Uh, it, it, they have uh, 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 a kind of uh, complicated uh, relationship in the past. I mean, the Hakan is a branch of the Taliban. But uh, uh, right now they are they are one uh, group and uh, they divided the power between themselves. Uh, a part of the Taliban, which are known as the Taliban or the, uh, the the South Taliban, they are taking, for example, the position of the defense minister, and Hakonis are uh, taking the position of inter interior minister and uh, the Taliban intelligence service. So shortly, I think uh, uh, whoever asked that question, the question is really valid and the concern is really valid. Yes, thank you very much. Thank you very much. And um, uh, connecting to the issue of, of whether or not to, to recognize this, this Taliban government, a question for you, Richard. Richard. Um, the EU has noted a calibrated approach to the issue, that is, to not recognize the Taliban regime and its state, instead working through international organizations. Do you think this will be enough when we're facing a large humanitarian disaster? Do you have any thoughts on that? Um, well, I think the, um, uh, the the EU approach is engagement without recognition, um, and so they're dividing these two uh, two issues up. And I think there was a similar question as to um, how to address the financial and humanitarian issues without uh, benefiting um, the, the the Taliban. Um, I think this approach um, requires a lot of uh, uh, care and uh, sensitivity, and there are, you know, a, a great there is a great deal of of discussion now, uh, both uh, discussion at the diplomatic level on social media and and in 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 conventional media uh, as well as to how to 
deliver um, not just humanitarian aid, because it's agreed that that will not be sufficient, um, but how to get the economy going again um, without um, uh, recognizing or benefiting um, the Taliban. And I think that um, uh, uh, I, I'm not sure the approach so far is successful. Um, there was an attempt uh, about a week and a half ago um, by the US um, where um, uh, President Biden uh, issued an executive order. Uh, there was uh, approximately $7 billion uh, in the um, accounts of the Central Bank of Afghanistan, which is, which is uh, held in the US. Uh, and he made a decision to divide that between um, the claimants, half of it, for the claimants of the, uh, uh, the victims of the 9-11 um, attacks in the US, so American victims, um, and the other half for humanitarian purposes, um, uh, 3.5 billion, billion, which would be routed through the UN and other bodies. And there's been a good deal of, of, of pushback on that. Firstly, because um, it's seen as Afghan's money uh, and, 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 and therefore seen as, um, as theft, um, uh, but also because it won't work, uh, that the formula for uh, developing a mechanism to, to stimulate the economy and inject cash into the economy without benefiting the Taliban doesn't, it still seems to be under discussion and isn't yet uh, agreed. Thank you. And thank you. There are so many interesting questions coming in and, and so many <laughs> sort of things I'd like to follow up on here, but unfortunately we're running a bit short on time, but there will be a question and ask, answer uh, session at the end. Uh, of this seminar where we'll hopefully be able to ask some more of these questions and and we'll also get might be able to get back individually on, on, on some of the questions uh, but for now we'll have to go on a short break in order for us to stretch our legs before the next session so if i kindly ask you all to reconvene and get back here at 10:35. Uh, and then we'll continue with session two, uh, building the Afghan nation. Uh, so short break now. Let's reconvene at 10.35. Thank you. Welcome back, everybody. I'll give you a sort of small minute to get back into listening mode. I think we've had a... And my role is now to change from uh, speaker mode to moderator mode. And it's a pleasure, it's a pleasure for me to, uh, to, ho to moderate the second session, which will take us into a slightly different direction. I think during the, during the first session, we really looked at sort of the link between international, international politics and law and how this played out in Afghanistan, both in the context of the war on terror, in the context of how to deal with the current Taliban regime, and also in the context of human rights law and how human rights law has been affected, not changed by, by but affected by the past, uh, past, uh, decades engagement in Afghanistan. I think one of the, in a way, the morning, morning session leaves us with this, at least me with this sense of, well, actually, um, uh, it would be very necessary to find a very principled approach of how to deal with the current situation, current government, Taliban government de facto Taliban government in Afghanistan. At the same time as, well, while looking for that principled approach, of course, the humanitarian situation is worsening by the day in Afghanistan. So uh, the point of this session is to, again, take a step backwards, but take a step in a 
different direction. We we'll look at what do you actually work on, work with these issues. We have two excellent panelists. First, Najiba Sanjar, who for many years headed the Swedish Afghanistan Committee's uh, regional office in northern Afghanistan. So lots of experience for actually trying to work on governance, development, and human rights issues on the ground. And then Torbjörn Pettersson, former ambassador, former Swedish Af ambassador to Afghanistan, who, who during his career has combined combined work, work in the development field with political work in Afghanistan, but also elsewhere. So very much looking forward to the presenta presenta presentations. Najiba, the floor is yours. Um, thank you so much. Uh, sorry for giving me the opportunity to, uh, to share my experiences. Uh, from Afghanistan on the um, on the topics of uh, uh, development issues, uh, I will share my um, uh, presentation. I, I hope that um, I can do this. Um, I have shared, so I hope it is appearing. Um, before. Um, um, before um, uh, going through walking, walking you through the through my pr uh, presentations on lessons learned from development pr uh, practices uh, from Afghanistan, I would like to um, uh, share a story with you. Um, the, the the story is about um, a man who has lost his key. Um, the man is the man is looking um, for for uh, for his key for for so long, and then uh, suddenly a neighbor notices that uh, uh, that he is looking for his key for so long, and then he, he steps in and and asks him, um, "I noticed that you you're looking for something. Can I help you?" And the man says, "I'm I have lost my key." And uh, I'm looking for it. And the, the, the neighbor uh, says, where did you lose your key? And the man answers, I, I lost it in front of my apartment in the, in the, in the corridor. And then the neighbor says, um, uh, OK, so why are you looking your key here if you lost it in the apartment? And the man uh, responds, uh, I, uh, because uh, inside is very dark, so it is light. That is why I am, I'm looking for my key here because it is, it is the light. So this is exactly um, from, my, from my experiences. This is what, what really happened in Afghanistan. So after, um, um, after the collapse of uh, Taliban in 2000, um, 2001, um, the, the demands for um, supporting Afghanistan and re building Afghanistan was very huge by international communities led by the uh, US uh, government. But unfortunately, oh, I think I cannot share my, I cannot uh, change. Yes, now I think it works. Um, uh, but unfortunately, um, um, what was missing, a uh, coherent, coherent strategy at political level to rebuild Afghanistan. And um, because without having a clear picture um, on Afghanistan, without understanding of expected impact and a good knowledge how the development uh, funds will, um, will help Afghanistan to rebuild. Um, the international communities didn't um, uh, trust government of the new government of Afghanistan. So all um, funds were channeled through the international organizations to, to work on development uh, uh, projects and programs in Afghanistan. And um, unfortunately, um, since, since, since there was no coordination among all these, these funds, 
and even from my experiences, even the uh, organizations who are implementing in development plans in Afghanistan, they, they even didn't, didn't coordinate at activity levels. Even at activity level, there were a lot of, a lot of overlaps in one, in one regions, in one areas, while, while uh, missing, um, uh, completely missing another regions or provinces uh, uh, to intervene. So the, the, the interventions were not really uh, coordinated and, and it was uh, um, created a lot of gaps because some parts of the country was receiving too much uh, and some, some parts of the, the country and, and, and people didn't receive, didn't benefit from the development at all. And um, so it was, it, was, it was a big gap. So, and, and another thing they were, the, 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 the pressure for spending the funds uh, by, by, by international uh, organizations, by, by the, by the uh, donors were also very, very high. So the, the time frame for spending the money for running the, the development uh, programs or projects is well, was also not very realistic. And uh, since the pressure was, was very high to report back to the donors and uh, the money was very, very huge. Um, so the, the organizations, they were hurrying to, to just spend the money. The focus was not on whether the projects or the programs reducing impact and they are changing the lives of people, changing the, the economy and then changing, creating impact or results, but they were just finishing the, the funds and then and, uh, um, uh, to prepare reports and to report back to the donors. And this situation and this chaos created another, another problem in Afghanistan. And this is, this is corruption because without, um, uh, without a proper infrastructures uh, in place in Afghanistan to, to control the, the money spent in Afghanistan is in, a, in a very controlled uh, manner. So it created a lot of, a lot of Opportunities for power brokers and then for the for the people to to mis misuse the the funds received, and it created another big problems. And then it created so many other other projects to to fight the corruption in Afghanistan. And and. and another shall. Um, um, lesson learned from Afghanistan. Um, actually, uh, the insecurity. The insecurity increased over time, and it also undermined the whole development uh, work in Afghanistan. So um, most of the, the regions, um, insecure regions, they they remained uh, uncovered. So they were not. Uh, uh, covered uh, by the development projects because it was very difficult to to go there and it was always in in conflict um, and the conflict increased because because Taliban as a huge uh, uh, huge number of uh, uh, population in Afghanistan it was totally ignored because after, after the collapse of the um, uh, ta Taliban government, Taliban regime, uh, um, the, the assumptions by the international um, communities or uh, um, United States that, um, so um, the Taliban is not out of power, so they cannot, they cannot uh, do any, anything, but, that, but in fact, Taliban, not as a government, but Taliban, as a group of people in Afghanistan was totally ignored and they were not engaged in the process of a post-conflict peace building process in Afghanistan. So a Taliban is not, Tal Taliban is not a, a government, but it was a people. You can see now, of course, in Afghanistan, 
the majority of people from other ethnic uh, group are, are not supporting Taliban, but there are so many people who are supporting Taliban. It means that there are people of Afghanistan and they were not, the reconstruction in Afghanistan took place without uh, engaging Taliban in the, uh, in the post uh, um, peace building process in Afghanistan. So as a result, what happened, and also they were also uh, totally ignored as a as a anti-political uh, um, um, group or armed group, and they 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 could re rebuild themselves, and and this is exactly what happened after twenty years, and they took the power in Afghanistan. They were also emerging in. Uh, early 2006, I think that they, they were establishing themselves and they were receiving a lot of support by the, by the people in, in remote areas in, in some countries, uh, in some uh, provinces in Afghanistan. So um, the, the, the reason when, the, when this insecurity, of course, uh, happened, um, it created a uh, um, a bigger gap between the people in the conflict areas and, and of course, the, the government. So the gov government was not able to, to access to those regions under the direct uh, control of the uh, Taliban. Um, and security, insecurity also um, reduced the foreign investment or, yeah, in Afghanistan because the fear of losing the businesses, nobody was ready to invest in Afghanistan. So the, the private sector in Afghanistan was, was, uh, was really um, not flourishing. It was not developing. So this, this was a, a big uh, uh, issue uh, since the, the demands for the employment was increasing day by day. By day. A lot of, a lot of thousands of uh, um, youths graduating from university and they needed, they needed uh, jobs and they, they needed employment and needed, they needed to, to, to work, but there was no, no job uh, employment for them. Only the few positions that was create that uh, development funds creating uh, within uh, international or, or national NGOs. And even that in the, the last, uh, um, recent years, even that was really, really rare and not um, not enough for the uh, for the youth. So it it, it also caused um, um, a lot of a lot of uh, problems because frustration among the young generation. So the young generations either either supported the, the politicians, so they were um, supporting them, uh, campaigning for them to. And not because they were they were supporting the political views, but they were they were supporting only because so they they could be a part of the the government, so they they can they could access to employment and resources and all these things. And some of those um, young generation, even educated ones, who were not able to to find themselves within the uh, government of. Uh, within the government, so they also the in incentive was very high to join the Taliban, and it was it it, it was also increased the, the insecurity more in Afghanistan. And um, most of them were educated educated people, of course. I I found this. Um, uh, this is interesting pictures. Uh, I, I, I'm sorry, I don't know the source because I, I, I took it from the social media. It really, really, uh, I was, I was, the, I, I really liked the picture. You see, um, it is a man, a man, the Taleb, that, that, that seems that he has, um, has taken gun to fight, uh, but he, he's also interested in reading. He has, he's interested, he's interested to enter a, a, a bookshop and, and take a book and read it. Sometimes we have the assumptions that Taliban are uneducated and they don't, they, they're not interested in books and they're not interested in schools and universities. But 
that is totally uh, the picture gives us a, a, a different a, a different perspective. Um, it means the government of Afghanistan failed to provide opportunities for it, for young generations to study, to go to university, and also find an employment. And this is this is also one of the reasons that when frustrations um increases the the young generation decides to go and stand by the Taliban and fight against the government um another another lesson learned that we we have to learn from the uh, past 20 years to the building of Afghanistan was lack of understanding of the Afghan context. As already mentioned, Afghanistan is a country that experienced civil war for many, many years and uh, experienced a brutal regime of the Taliban. Um, and also this is a diverse, diverse uh, um, country with, with uh, at least three big ethnic group uh, um, who are um, trying to uh, compete for gaining the powers and uh, and equal opportunities in development and and um, in education and power and everything. And this was um, and 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 this was uh, very um, and lack of understanding that. I'm sorry that the slide changed. Lack of understanding social, economic, and uh, political, and economic, uh, economic and political dynamics in Afghanistan. Of course, it will um, it will not help to uh, to carry out development uh, work in Afghanistan. And, uh, and um, on the other hand, it will not only help the development and fair distribution of the resources and uh, uh, equal opportunities for all people of Afghanistan to, to benefit from this development work. It also creates a, a lot of conflicts and, and problem. And uh, uh, unfortunately, it was, it was missed during the development process in Afghanistan because there was no lack of a, um, a proper strategy how to, to intervene to make sure that all um, people of Afghanistan, regardless of their uh, their ethnicities, are benefiting benefiting from the uh, from development funds and equal opportunities. And it was it was missed unfortunately, unfortunately in, during the development process. And uh, on the other hand, it helped the the power brokers, the the people who are uh, um, who access to to the funds and they 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 become uh, wealthier, but the poor people in, in remote areas, they remained as poor as they were before. And this was something I think um, we all knew. We all knew for the last, um, for the last uh, 20 years in Afghanistan, uh, the reports by, uh, by um, uh, World Bank shows that the development fund really, really, or the interventions, Really helped to to uh, decrease the the poverty rate in Afghanistan. On the contrary, it was it was increasing every year. Um, another lesson learned from Afghanistan is that sustainability and unrealistic um, uh, timeline for the projects that that were expected to be to be implemented in Afghanistan. Um, so many projects were designed. It was very short time, two years, three years. And, and we, in a, in a complicated um, uh, context like Afghanistan. So of course, uh, a short term project will never respond to the, to the needs and, and never it will, it will uh, produce uh, intended results. So this is a missed, uh, uh, just waste of resources. 
uh, in Afghanistan. And the, ta the, 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 sh the timeline of project in, in three years, even five, five years. And of course it is, uh, it will not uh, uh, produce any results. So the projects uh, implemented and the reports prepared, but, but the results is, is really um, without producing any, any results. And it was also because, uh, because of the uh, pressure uh, by the donors and, um, and also the widespread corruption. Uh, the, uh, half of those monies just, just uh, went to the private pockets and never spent on the development uh, uh, projects in Afghanistan. Uh, in the beginning, uh, after right after the collapse, um, so even the in the the, the uh, um, development organizations, uh, it was humanitarian, of course, humanitarian uh, organizations. So the, the lack of monitoring and evaluation. Um, uh, it, it also was one of the, the reasons that the projects were not implemented as, as it was expected. Later on, when most of the, most of the, orga uh, the organizations, they changed their direction approaches from humanitarian to the development uh, work, assuming that, okay, the needs are, uh, now the needs change and now we have to shift from, from humanitarian work to the development. Um, um, while it was still not realistic, of course, uh, as an organization, um, it might, uh, uh, you might change directions because you have worked for so many years for the humanitarian um, um, area. Now, uh, now you're looking for more sustainable um, uh, approach, but, but, uh, but the question was really, really, it was a time that we needed to shift for the um, development work um, uh, based on the, the realities of, of, the, uh, of the country. Um, so even, even shifting to development activities is still, uh, for so many years, organization lacked this then uh, a, a proper monitoring and evaluation system within the organizations. And um, even when they established this system, it was not to, to be a learning process for the organizations to stop and step back and see what, what have gone wrong and what is, uh, um, do we uh, ask very difficult questions from, from themselves to, to uh, to go on, to carry on, to change, or, or uh, do we uh, create impacts? Uh, uh, is the, the program sort of effective or not? But, but, but the, this uh, um, um, critical questions never, never happened, unfortunately. This monitoring and evaluation was only and only to, to prepare the reports and to convince the donors and to tell them that, yes, we have the system and everything is in place and everything is going well uh, without uh, committing the realities, without confessing that there are a lot of shortcomings, there are a lot of problems that needs to be addressed. Yes, of course, we are not able to, to, to finish the funds within the promised time, but, but there should be flexibility. We have to correct this and that. But unfortunately, from my experience, such things never happened. And we, we just moved on, ignoring the shortcomings, ignoring the, the problems, and without producing the impact because, because we just wanted to move for the sake of move on for the sake of completing the projects and the activities without producing any 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 result. Yeah, so um, basically it is um, um, there are a lot of um, a lot of loss and loss. So due to the time constraints, I just limited myself to a few um, lesson learned that is very very critical uh, for us because we have to we have to learn. International communities has to uh, has to be aware of uh, uh, these lesson learned. And uh, 
for for uh, for re re intervening in Afghanistan uh, at this stage when Taliban is ruling Afghanistan, uh, if with the in, uh, if there is an uh, a willingness or intentions to 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 uh, fund development pro development project and work and also um, lesson learned for um, uh, intervening in other uh, war torn countries to to rebuild the, the country uh, with a clear understanding and knowledge from the from the ground, not just for the sake of uh, injecting money to to help, but but also knowing that how this money is 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 really helping the the country is the money really rebuilding or it is it is just waste of time and resources. Thank you. Thank you very much, Najiba. Last but not least, let's turn to Torbjörn Pettersson. I think you have a you have a complicated task to try to pull this together, but I'm sure that you are up to the task. We have on the one hand this very this this sort of image of uh, competing international projects that have come to change international law, well, international law tries to regulate, but the projects have also changed international law. And then the picture painted by Najiba of a local level, a population in Afghanistan, largely forgotten in this, in the feet of these big projects. So the floor is yours, Torbjörn. Uh, Thank you very much. Uh, I'll try to share my screen um, to give. And first of all, while I do that, uh, thank you very much for having me, all of you. Um, let's see, did that succeed? It's shared. It shares, yeah. Let's see if I can get it into the right mode here. Um, Did it disappear? Okay, sorry, let me do that again. Um, okay, so I try to use it like this. Um, well, first of all, thank you all very much for having me uh, and thank you for holding these seminars. Uh, I have a, a, a topic that, as Sari says, is quite challenging, and I'm a bit out of my depth here because I'm not really a legal expert. I'm a development practitioner, diplomat, a humanitarian worker, and many other things, but I have never studied law. So, in though I dealt quite a bit with it in, in my diplomatic work, so I try to, to take it from there. Uh, I actually, it was so funny to, to have Najib as the speaker before me, because my first encounter with Afghanistan was indeed Talukan in 1989, when I met Amish Shah Massoud after liberated Talukan from the Soviet uh, control. So I have uh, worked with Afghanistan for many years. What I would like to do uh, now is to share my take on the big issues. Um, that I was asked to comment and reflect a bit on, on. And I will focus on the period when I was most recently active uh, on the ground and in the work with Afghanistan. And I did that in three different positions from uh, 20, 2008 to 2010. I was Secretary General of the Swedish Committee for Afghanistan. So the organization Nadiba has worked a lot with in, in Talukan. I was then Sweden's ambassador to Afghanistan 2010 to 12. And after that, I led the uh, conflict department of Swedish International Development Authority responsible for, among other things, Afghanistan and, and Swedish humanitarian aid. So these six years is where I try to, to uh, reflect upon, and I think it has bearing on, on the whole 20 years that Sari spoke about initially today. And, and I must say, I, I do share a lot of the view Sari and, and Adiba have expressed. So I will try not to, to repeat that, but take it from the perspectives I have from, from these years. So um, first, 
setting the scene of, of, of this period, uh, I would say there are a couple of features which were kind of uh, very decisive to much, much of what we try to do. Uh, first of all, this period, 2008 to 14, was, if you want, the, the last half of the pure occupation of Afghanistan by, by foreign forces. Uh, in 2014, security responsibility was handed over, and 2008 to 14 was, in a way, the end of, of the, the first actual, um, say, hard military phase of the war on terror in Afghanistan. Uh, it, one one uh, very clear um, feature of this period was a growing disconnect and distrust between the Afghan government and its international partners. Um, it was, um, I think you could say there were two main reasons and, and, and two kind of uh, the highest level of distrust or the reasons for distrust was, were twofold, I would say. One was the, the um, election of 2009, which was a very fraudulent connection, very unclear outcome and, and not up to any any international standards whatsoever, uh, showing, I think, or giving the impression among, among the international community partners that your, your African partner was not really serious in, in, the, in the core democratic state building. On the other hand, from the Afghan government perspective, you had a new uh, regime. Uh, the Obama administration had taken over in, in the White House. They formulated a new US strategy, which then became, of course, a main ingredient of, of the international community strategy in Afghanistan. And they did that without almost any consultation with their Afghan partners. It was, it was done basically in the White House. You can all read the book Obama's Wars if you want the details of that. Uh, and I think that was felt as, as uh, uh, by, the, by the Afghan government as, as a breach of the kind of understanding that had been there from the Bonn Agreement uh, that kind of started the, the state building phase of, of our engagement in Afghanistan. Second is, as, and it's not specific for this period, but all through the 20 years, opium production and narcotics trade have been corrupting many attempts of creating accountable governments. Uh, and, and that continued to grow during these years, uh, there were several initiatives to kind of hamper it, but, but uh, all of them more or less unsuccessful. The resurgence of the Taliban was gaining ground. It started really in 2006. Uh, and by during these six years that I, I was active, uh, Taliban were, were gaining ground and, and controlling uh, ever larger parts of the, de facto controlling ever larger parts of of especially southern but also western and, and parts of northern Afghanistan. Um, maybe the most important thing working as a diplomat um, in, in these years was the, the President Obama's new US strategy. It's really had three components. Uh, one was the so-called FPAC diplomacy, uh, which meant basically that uh, the White House recognized that if you were to defeat the Taliban, if you were to stop their, their uh, resurgence, you had to get Pakistan on board because it was really Pakistan who hold, uh, held the, the key to, to uh, some kind of more peaceful or, or negotiated or not a solution of, of the uh, increased intensity of the internal war in Afghanistan. Uh, the second was really Pentagon's experience from Iraq um, uh, were used as a blueprint for how to do it in Afghanistan, which was the counterinsurgency, so-called so coin strategy, which meant basically that uh, the military, the international uh, forces uh, went from, on the one hand, from surveying to actually um, taking part in, in combat operations together with their Afghan counterparts and um, also focusing more on, on training and policing than, than what was done during the early phase of the, of the war on terror in, in Afghanistan. And the third component was the so-called civilian search, 
was basically uh, encouragement to, to other partners and, and a huge budget contribution by the US themselves to, um, to fund infrastructure development in Afghanistan. Uh, channeled, I should say, through, and that's the, the, my fifth point here, uh, channeled predominantly through a NATO-led security-focused state-building exercise led by the so-called provincial reconstruction teams, which were 26 of them uh, run by 21 nations. And they had changed from, from having a pure uh, security uh, mandate to having a broader mandate of developing not only security uh, forces and policing, but also uh, governance in general. Uh, and that kind of overshadowed or sat uncomfortably with the, the more, let's say, conventional UN-led state-centered civilian development corporation with the objective of creating a, a, a democratic liberal or liberal democracy in, in Afghanistan. So, so uh, um, I will come back to that point later on and, and, and as a conclusion, I think is quite, quite important for this period. Uh, the last point uh, in, in setting the scene is, is just to remember that during this time, transition of the security responsibility to Afghan structures was the overarching objecti objective of the state building. So it was, uh, using Sari's word, very short-sighted also in this phase of the war on terror. The, the, the objective was 2014 when we were supposed to to hand over to, to Afghan structures. Um, and, and everything that was done was affected very much by that objective. And of course, the reason was that the US and, and the other international partners were getting um, fed up with spending so much money on, on military operations in Afghanistan. So basically uh, there was a, a, a push to, to uh, be very short-sighted in, in everything you done did to, to reach this, this objective. So I see if I can move to um, my third point. Um, I think uh, some of, of my, my uh, legally trained and, and active colleagues have spoken about this, but uh, still just um, um, some reflections from, from a different diplomatic perspective and, and also uh, to some extent from my experience as Secretary General of the Swedish Committee for Afghanistan, which is a big development and humanitarian actors. Uh, the, the, the international law issues were complex and interwoven and all that, but they also each, every one of them quite controversial, which meant there wasn't really a clear answer to, to you know, what does a very common question, of course, around the tables, diplomatic tables in, in cover, what, what is the international law perspective? And then you look at some poor international legal expert and they explain that you could think either this way or that way, because these are all controversial issues and there were issues developing as, as indeed is, is part of the discussion we have here today. One is of course on non-state actors and international humanitarian law. Uh, we had a, a lot of, of non-state actors, and that was also history. Many of us who have worked as humanitarian workers in, in Afghanistan and elsewhere. So, of course, these were not entirely new issues, but they, they were put at, at, at an extreme test in, in parts of Afghanistan due to the, these uh, contradicting objectives of, of the international community intervention. So it, it was always, I don't know how many times I tried to explain to various players in the field or a theater, as some of them call it, uh, the difference uh, between development work, which is normative and, and if you want biased and so, and a more neutral humanitarian work. And it, it, it's, it's, as we know, it's, it's, um, it's not a clear cut line, even theoretically from a desk point of view, but when you're in the Afghan, the reality in Afghanistan those days with, with uh, a mixture of objectives uh, for NGOs, for implementers of, of development cooperation, for humanitarian workers, for the different parts of the Afghan government, it's indeed extremely 
difficult to draw these lines in, in reality. Uh, what, what is the, when, when do you apply humanitarian principles and law and when are you more, more have, do you have a more normative uh, or if you want political approach to, to developments in Afghanistan? But that was a very current discussion and many, many uh, uh, hours spent on, on trying to, to handle that. Um, we also had the growth of private security contractors their responsibilities and accountability was extremely unclear. We had quite a few incidents of, of the brutality in, in their warfare, uh, of their breaking humanitarian law, and no one really was, you, you went and spoke with a NATO responsible officer who wasn't really uh, in charge of things because of the, the action you were discussing was taken by private security contractors, they on their hand, uh, consider themselves some kind of sheriff or deputy sheriff with, with you know, all kind of, of uh, mandate that they could think of having themselves. So, so quite a lot of, of challenges in that. And then, of course, the larger war on terror practices that we've spoken about, both Richard and, and Sari before, so I don't have to, to go into them again. But more specifically, um, the civilian casualties um, I hate the word collateral damage, but, but that's the word that was used uh, for, for all the civilian casualties, both of conventional warfare and increasingly during the Obama administration by drone attacks, by the, the enormous increase in, in use of drones and, and all the unclarities. And, and I think, quoting McChrystal, the former commander of, of the NATO force, to say the arrogance of that of that military technique, which of course something which also affected not only from a legal but also from a moral and, and, and perspective. Um, and then not least, and maybe again I will come back a little bit on that to, to the most, most uh, what I say, depressing um, experience from, from those years is the kind of um, neglect of the transitional justice process. Uh, after all, in the Bonn Agreement at the start, there was awareness, there was at least some, some um, ambition to try by, by establishing an Afghan independent human rights commission, uh, doing a report, coming up with proposals. And so that was then not implemented by 2009 and, and slowly forgotten by everyone. And, and which meant that impunity became the rule. Uh, so, so everyone, all those um, crimes that was real and perceived uh, from the 24 years of, of war before uh, 2002 uh, were kind of forgotten and impunity was, was more or less given to everyone and, and, and uh, old um, uh, people with a lot of blood on the hands, presumably, were coming back into politics uh, and, and, and were able to, to wash that off. Uh, so that was also an issue uh, which was uh, very, very uh, important in, in how things went before and after those, the years, the years I'm talking about. Um, just to say a little bit more on, on the development, the Swedish development and, and human rights. Um, it is to me and, and, and to Sweden uh, quite obvious that developing a human rights system and institutions is crucial and strategic to achieve the objectives of, of development cooperation in Afghanistan overall. And uh, since 2002, it parallels socioeconomic development as the raison d'etre for Swedish development cooperation in Afghanistan. So obviously, it was the main area of, of work and, and, um, and, and dialogue uh, with international partners, and not least with, with the, um, and not least with the Afghan government, of course. Uh, a building a capable and accountable state institution was, as well as civil society, was the key area for, for Swedish development cooperation with a special focus on, on women's rights. And I think what I would like to, to you know, with the risk of, of um, uh, having a little bit of what I think Richard 
called a, a top-down approach. I think one, one has to realize that working with Afghanistan, it, this poses as challenges since you have neither in institutions, I would say, or among the general public, an understanding of, of human rights, or indeed sometimes of individual rights as a concept at all. So you start from a very difficult position in explaining what had been signed by the government, what has been agreed in the Bonn Agreement. I remember reading that. I was then in Tanzania and I saw the what 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 this new government had had uh, signed on to, and I thought this can't really be Afghanistan because there were no reservations, there were no discussions. So so we kind of came from a very top-down perspective, uh, in in and and I think it was perceived as a, as a top-down perspective. So what what was crucial was on the one hand to it was quite clear that that having a human rights perspective on development cooperation a rights-based approach to everything we do was the foundation for a peaceful development you worked in an environment where you found almost no history or, or deep individual understanding of human rights as a concept so it of course there you there was a, a um, uh, we and everyone who worked and not least all the young and eager and ex fantastic Afghan colleagues that I work with developed uh, a quite a, a substantial knowledge and understanding of this and, and, and gained experience and, and were also quite capable in, in dialoguing with, with uh, the, the more traditional Afghan society. But still you, you, you very often and I think I've seen also some of the questions in the chat. I think you, you still uh, do that in an environment where rights are collective rather than individual, uh, where, where there's a history of parts of the rights concept uh, um, seen as, as a kind of imperialist, um, part of an imperialist uh, attitude at all, uh, and, and much broader than in the actual resistance to what we were doing, but more of a, in, in much broader uh, um, parts of the society. Um, so development has to be very rights-based, has to have a very strong focus on human rights to achieve its objectives. On the other hand, you are working in a very difficult, uh, um situation not only because of because of the of all the uh, the legal issues that i mentioned before but and the war is war on terror but also because of the the type of environment you're working on um so i don't know how i am with time um but let me move on to some... minute or two Okay, thank you. So I tried to do some tentative conclusions on my experience focusing on this period. Um, I think it's important always to say that the people sent to socioeconomic support basically health, education. And I do agree with Nadiba, we've done so many mistakes and, and pouring a lot of money into a civilian search was not the, the most clever move to take. But so, so, so that fed corruption and, and it created uh, unrealistic deadlines and all that. Having said all that, I still claim that the people sent the socioeconomic support have largely have, have been successful in creating some opportunities for development. I think we are a lot better off. When I, I, I compare often on an individual basis, the, the horse travel I made with the Mujahideen in the late, uh, 80s, early 90s, with with the traveling in the countryside I did in in, in 2008, 2012, and 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 I think you do see a lot of socioeconomic development. Uh, of course, not forgetting the the um, population growth has been enormous during these years as well. So so of course it doesn't feel like that, but but and there are of course development indicators. I, I try never to use statistics when it comes to Afghanistan because I know how it's been collected so, so I, but still the best is the best um, um, proof we have that that has been largely successful in creating opportunities maybe not the most cost-effective development corporation I've, I've worked with in, the, in, in my life but 
but definitely uh, there is something to build on there. My view is that the main failure is the failure of transitional justice uh, because it undermined the legitimacy of any government, both nationally among people, and, and, and Nadiba spoke to that quite a lot, so I won't, and she's probably much better place to judge that than me, but also internationally, because we knew that, you know, the, the ministers or the shadow ministers that in, in reality decide, the power, bro power brokers, are crooks, uh, and many of them have have committed atrocities and, 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 and are suspected of, of grave violations of, of human rights. And, and, and uh, we didn't deal with that in the process, neither we nor the Afghan regime that took over. So I think that kind of undermined the whole idea of democratic elections, given, you know, even if there wasn't fraud. And so people were very hesitant to believe in the outcome of that kind of, of processes. So if there's one mistake, one lesson I learned is that well, in the type of situations that Afghanistan were in, and there's a few, I mean, you can look at Libya today, you can look at Mali and, and where you're working now, sorry, and or many other places where I've been. And if you skip that step in the process of, of transitional justice, you, you, you make it very difficult to create some kind of positive, lasting or, or uh, sustainable, peaceful development. And finally, it's been said before, and I don't, need to repeat it, but but I can uh, just testify from my experience as a development leader and, and diplomat that this going back and forth between the two objectives of war and terror, short term, very specific and democratic state building was a challenge and uh, all through the period and, and um, very frustrating for a Swedish diplomat, of course, because when in conflict, in the end, how, how much you uh, argued, it was also always the war on terror, if there was a conflict. It's not always a conflict, of course, but if there was a conflict, it was always the war on terror approach that was eminent. So some conclusions, uh, one positive, two, I would say negative, and a lot of lessons to learn from Afghanistan. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Torbjörn. And, uh... Before I hand over to Emilia for sort of the final panel, I just have a, a question each for the panelists. First, uh, I'd want to turn to Najiba so that Urbion can breathe a little after his presentation. And uh, Najiba, I mean, you give a very, quite a sort of depressing image, but the correct one, definitely on the context of development in Afghanistan. And, but if we look at this, if we then, uh, if we look at this history, what about now? Is there, is there trust from the side of the local population in to embrace possible international engagement again for development and for change? And if there isn't, uh, what alternatives are there? Can we think about a sort of different kind of uh, you know, bottom-up approach to development and change? Um, thank you, sir, sir, for the questions. It is very, a very, very important question. Um, if, I, if I ask another question out of these questions, do Afghan have, a, uh, have another choice except embracing the international community's support? Of course, the answer, the answer is not, because we, the people of Afghanistan at this situation, they don't have any other choice except relying on international communities, community support. Um, what, what, what I'm uh, emphasizing is that uh, we should not repeat the same mistakes. So even with a better government at that time, when 2000, 2001, the Taliban collapsed and the new regime, so the, um, the, the uh, uh, support by international communities created so many, so many other problems. And this is, was inequality among them, inequal distribution of resources to the different ethnic groups. 
and uh, and also the uh, corruption. So it also uh, enriched the power brokers, politicians, and then um, parliamentarians, and those who are who are accessing even within the international NGOs, even the NGO development workers. Some of them became very very rich and wealthy. So uh, because because there was no no um, infrastructures to manage these funds properly and 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 and, and, and the supervision and I uh, on the on the um, uh, managing the funds. So the same the same um, could happen. The same could happen now even with the talk with now by the name of uh, humanitarian supports to the people of Afghanistan. So. What is very important that we need to make sure the, the humanitarian support reaches to the people of Afghanistan. I'm not talk, when I talk about people of Afghanistan, it is everyone in Afghanistan, including the, the Pashtuns, who are most of the, the Taliban or Pashtuns. So it, it should reach everyone who is really in need and in need of support. And, and we need to make sure that the funds are going. Uh, benefiting those people who really need support. So not releasing the funds by the name of humanitarian supports to, to help and change the life. And we, all, we also need to make sure that the funds are reaching the one who really need, who needs support. So this is really, really important. Otherwise, if we, if we cannot make sure this, if you are not really establishing a mechanisms before releasing the funds, injecting the funds, then we are repeating the same mistake in Afghanistan. Thank you very much, Najiba. And to Albion, following on this quite sort of depressing image, you mentioned the sort of the culture of impunity in Afghanistan and of course, in the theory of international law, there should be no amnesty, there can be no amnesty for war crimes and atrocity crimes. You mentioned very sort of correctly that the practice in Afghanistan was the opposite. There was near complete impunity and uh, that impunity definitely undermined the sort of state and nation building project. What could have been done differently, given the, as you say, the sort of the complicated situation in Afghanistan of this state building project next to the war on terror? How could we have done better in actually upholding the international law norms of uh, no amnesty for war crimes and atrocity crimes? Um, yeah, it's a difficult question, of course. What should we have done? I, I think one, maybe, and there are, are, are colleagues in this panel who knows a lot more about that, but the feeling I had was that the plan that was there, the call for justice process, was um, maybe a bit unrealist unrealistically ambitious. Uh, but so I think what we could have done correctly, and, and please, I, I don't, I'm now speaking as a diplomat and, and a, not as, uh, from a legal perspective, but I think one, one could have done some more, uh, f uh, a little bit more of what was actually planned by, by addressing some of the, what seemed to be the more obvious violations of, of human rights uh, bordering on, on, on you know all kind of, of terrible uh, uh, labels that, that that you probably know better than me to use but I mean there were some figures to, to and, and, and groups that were kind of let into the warmth that that should have been been let into the warmth and and I think that 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 would be one thing it's it's I mean, you maybe you would have to recognize that there there would still be a real of part of quite a lot of de facto impunity because things were so complicated. The accusations were going back and forth, and the long process would would be very difficult to manage from from the view of the multi ethnic politics and so forth. But but there was some kind of of, of um, 
steps that could have been taken against the individuals, not letting them into the vault again, and, and not letting de facto, uh, letting there be an establishment of a parallel government structure on the government side, consisting of, of, of a group of men who were almost, oh, almost certainly all of them on, on the list that should be that that should be be uh, followed up more seriously by the commission i think that would have been one and maybe also a bit more of recognition i mean the only thing that was done was some monuments and so forth put up to to kind of recognize victims and 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 that's a, a poor excuse so to say but i think one could do a bit more of, of recognition of of uh, what had happened during the 80s and 90s especially the 90s i would say um uh, to to just show Afghan people in general that that you care um, that that this is you know I, I think there would be a lot of understanding that that you can solve all this and and a lot of agreements and so forth but but the way it was left just uh, hanging there almost provocatively uh, uh, neglecting what was so blatantly obvious to everyone was was the worst thing we could do so. I don't have an answer of what would be the perfect solution, but but not to just kill that process in 2009, I think would, would have been a step forward. Yes, yeah. Thank you very much, Torbjörn. And I know it is a very, it is a very complicated question, but it's a, it is an important question. How to deal with impunity. Uh, I'm gonna now close this panel, but directly hand over to Emilia, who has the complicated task of taking us into a discussion. So the floor is yours, Emilia, and I hope that the other panelists can also join us for, um, for this discussion. Thank you, Sari. Um, this has been uh, incredibly rewarding and uh, you've all offered very, very rich presentations. And it's, as Sari says, it's very uh, tricky to know where to, to start. But we thought we could set up this discussion that I'll ask a fairly broad question and then perhaps Niels will ask one um, based on, on his work uh, with, uh, with the students. And then um, you'll all have a chance to, to offer kind of concluding comments so that we can uh, try to wrap on time. Um, but to start off, the, we've structured this seminar around two main central questions focused on how the war on terror um, is changing international law and interventions. And also given that the main challenge is at hand for sort of broader international justice. So with that in mind, we, we thought it was interesting the, the questions that Richard uh, raised in, uh, in his presentation. So based on what we've learned in Afghanistan, have international interventions instrumentalized human rights in your view? And if so, given what Tobian said on the understanding of human rights, how can we make these more relevant for for the people of Afghanistan. I thought perhaps maybe Najiba, if you would like to start, given that I've already called out Richard and Tobian, uh, if you have any uh, thoughts to start off with, if not, uh, everyone feel free to, to jump in. And if not, then Sari, not me, maybe Lecher. <laughs> That's fine. Sari, would you like to start off? My answer to Richard's question would be yes. I do think that international interventions have, uh, have uh, instrumentalized human rights. However, it is, uh, there is a question tied to that, um, which is, well, well, in a way, yes, uh, international interventions have instrumentalized human rights because human rights have become an add-on or a component in these uh, interventions that often, often have uh, quite different aims. At the same time, uh, looking at some of the, in, sort of looking at Afghanistan, for example, well, what would the intervention have looked like if there would have been no focus on human rights? Uh, what would the intervention have looked like if there wouldn't have been the different certain governments uh, 
certain, uh, certain components of the United Nations and civil society calling out both the Afghan government, but also the international partners saying, well, actually, now you're completely breaking international law. And so, so I think, yes, human rights are instrumentalized when they become part of mainstreamed into interventions. However, as mainstreamed, they also have some possibilities to impact the interventions. And they are also very remain extremely important as the sort of critical outside, as the sort of tools with which a common language with which to challenge abuse and uh, political agendas that are very contrary to international law or human rights. Thanks, Arif. Uh, Richard or Tulbjörn, do, do either of you feel compelled to, to expand on Sari's points? Um, uh, maybe I'll just have a, a quick word, if I may, Amelia. Um, um, I'm, and I agree with Sari, but, you know, I always, my question, I always come up with more questions. Um, and there were, you know, I... I think there's, I have a perception of a polarization around human rights in Afghanistan, um, that human rights is associated with, um, with one set of values, which is seen by not only Taliban, but mostly by Taliban, um, with a, a contrary set of values, that it's pitched as a kind of global north um, um, anti-Muslim or non-Muslim set of values against um, traditional Afghan culture and Sharia. Um, and uh, I think what, you know, hasn't maybe more needs to be done is to, to try and avoid this uh, polarization, uh, to try and, and uh, find common ground. Um, uh, and, and probably not enough was done on that, I uh, I worked quite a lot with the Afghan Human Rights Commission and also with uh, different human rights uh, NGOs in Afghanistan, um, and I'm I'm not certain that they did enough on this as well. I think they were reading from the textbooks a little bit too much, um, rather and and possibly even contributing a bit to to it in hindsight. Um, rather than figuring out where the shared values may lie that could um, um, engage in a discussion um, about, um, which would, would end up challenging violations and challenging impunity, ideally. Thank you, I'll stop there. I guess maybe uh, very, try to be very brief. First of all, of course, in a way you have to agree with sorry, an intervention without human rights is worse than one with some kind of human rights perspective. So in that sense, I, I, I think, I mean, I, I remember reading General Petraeus coin manual and it was parts of it like reading a human rights document on, on, on how people should be treated and so forth and that wouldn't have happened that wouldn't happen if we didn't have that approach but but i think the the main uh, uh, takeaway is, is something that that nadiba spoke about that the way it was implemented in afghanistan because of the initial set of the bond agreement as as we call it when 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 the the how should I term them? Uh, potential Taliban sympathizers were totally left out of the equation. And so you didn't really address uh, quite as, I mean, they, they were left silent and, and, and you created a, a with, with, with historic hindsight became then a, a perfect uh, uh, ground for the, for the Taliban to return in 2006. I think we had a choice there to have another approach on human rights. And, and I, I, I often had the kind of discussion that Richard alluded to, to some of the Afghan institutions that they turned a bit too textbook and a bit too, I mean, for example, we didn't use 
the the religious civil society that was there that was you know questioning trying to to grapple with 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 these kind of issues of, of islam and and and, uh, and uh, human rights that they were there they were around but they were not really part of the equation so i think we made a we missed a few opportunities there najiba do you want to add anything to that um, um yes yes i would like to add something um actually um the human rights uh, issues in Afghanistan has always been very sensitive. Even, even it was an approach taken by, by uh, many organizations as a, as a requirement by the international communities or the Bonn Agreement. But, uh, but the sensitivity has always been uh, in Afghanistan in the ground. It is not from, from the... Um, uh, Taliban sites only. Of, of course, Taliban totally ignore it and, and don't accept it. But even there are uh, local local people, uh, conservative people who are still against uh, against uh, uh, human rights. For example, they they they, they don't accept um, um, that that women or or men are equal. Um, for example, uh, so many uh, other things, they're, they're, they're really not, uh, uh, they don't agree with it. And it is very sensitive. That is why uh, even when, uh, when talking about the human rights and gender, gender equality in, in, in workshops and trainings, it was, it was always diff were, were difficult by the uh, uh, trainers uh, who delivered these this, this topics. And the understanding, of course, and the approach itself, and the development organizations themselves were were uh, struggling, struggling how to how to integrate human rights approach in the development development work itself was uh, not uh, um, it still was uh, was uh, I'm sorry, and still it was not integrated well. In the in the uh, development work itself, so um, the pressure was there, and the, um, uh, but it was not um, uh, um, digested by, by the uh, development workers, and also were, were sensitive uh, for the people of Afghanistan. So uh, they were uh, mm, mm, they were taking it but not really understanding or, or internalizing it or accepting it. This was, the, this was the problem. It seems a little bit like you were talking about during your lesson learned uh, intervention that there's a disconnect between sort of the context uh, on the ground and, and these types of... Uh, exactly, exactly. Mm -hmm. Thank you all for that. I'm just uh, I'm keen for, for Niels to, to get a question in from his uh, students. Well, we've had many questions from the students, but just something um, on behalf of the students, let's say. Uh, Niels, please go ahead. Yes, so 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 connecting to the ongoing international law course uh, here at the University of Gothenburg, to which this seminar forms an integral part, um, there is one question I'd like to raise um, connected to uh, international humanitarian law, um, which recognizes two types of conflict, international, uh, and non-international armed conflict. However, Afghanistan is an example of what is increasingly called internationalized non-international armed conflict, basically civil wars with a major international presence. Do you think that international humanitarian law needs to change to reflect these new kinds of conflict? Do you have any ideas on that? Uh, Sari, what, what would your case uh, take be on that? it's a it's a very good question and uh, i tend to be it depends on what you need we mean with change changing to changes to international law i do i when i when looking at both the sort of um, the ihl conventions when looking at human rights conventions as well i do think uh, going into a discussion we could have the same discussion around refugee law, law going into the discussion 
through the lens of should we start uh, redrafting the treaties that we have so that they adopt adapt to the current situation. My sense would always to go very conservative on, on this one and say no, because uh, you know what you have, and uh, if you open up a treaty to, without going into the whole uh, discussion of how how treaties change, but if you start uh, renegotiating treaties that have actually worked for quite a long time, well then you opened up for renegotiation on quite a few issues. And well, you know what you have, but things can always get worse. This said, I do think that, uh, and I know that the ICRC is doing it and many organizations as well are doing it. I do think that we need to recognize that, uh, that conflicts and how conflicts are fought are ch is changing. And we need to take, uh, we need to be very attentive to how, uh, to these changes on the ground and actually integrate them into our understanding of international law and how it should operate. So going back to what Richard and Torbjörn said, we shouldn't have a textbook. We shouldn't have uh, used textbook answers on these these questions, but actually go into the complexities. And that has to do with the question of what's the link currently, for example, what's the link between um, uh, national, national insurgencies and international terrorism? Does a certain situation merit an international presence? It also links back to the question of, uh, uh, well, uh, who who is a legitimate international presence? What do you do with uh, uh, international uh, contractors, mercenaries? We saw them in Afghanistan. We now see them in uh, the Sahel, for example. Should we have a more proper international response around these questions? So don't change the treaties, but look at the practice and look at uh, uh, deal with the very important international legal questions. Mm, thank you very much. Interesting reflection. Uh, does anyone else want to fill in on that question or have any reaction to that? Richard, Torbjörn, Najiba? Or... Not really. I think Sari gave perhaps an extensive answer. Yes. <laughs> I think Sari gave an excellent answer. I wouldn't disagree with a word of it. <laughs> so, Emilia, no. Emilia, more questions. Hey, we have a few more, and just want to remind everyone to to please, uh, you can still post uh, questions in the chat. Um, something that was asked earlier was um, so the ICC has said that it would uh, move forward with investigating crimes committed in Afghanistan post two thousand two. Um, and the court has also said that it would prioritize crimes committed by the by the Taliban. And I was wondering if you have any reflections on kind of practically how can these investigations move forward given the situation? If anyone has any uh, reflections on that, if not, we have other questions too. But this perhaps is quite a concrete question, maybe. Sorry. Um, no, I wasn't going to answer. I was going to suggest that Esan, it's a pity Esan has gone because, yeah, this, this, because he's, yeah, he he's studied this very closely. Um, but maybe I'll defer to Sari and then maybe add in something later. Uh, I was hoping that this was a question for Richard. <laughs> <laughs> I, I mean, uh, on the issue of ICC's involvement in Afghanistan has been controversial for over a decade now. It, it's been controversial early on, obviously, because of the issues that, that also Torbjörn reflected on the sort of, we have a long history of impunity in Afghanistan. ISIS's involvement can only deal with a period that focuses on 2002 forward. 
and it's been con controversial because of the issues that also both Najiba and others reflected on. Well, there is a slight distrust towards international law from, from the side of the Afghan population. It's, uh, it's not evident for an international court to engage in Afghanistan. I do, however, think that when we look back at how the Afghan civil society, for example, has engaged on, uh, on uh, towards the ICC, there is a, well, there is a, there's support for some form of ICC engagement because the support for getting questions around accountability into the political and political and practical practical discussions in Afghanistan. The ICC took the controversial perspective, or recently the controversial the perspective of uh, to only continue on uh, focusing on crimes committed by by the Taliban. Personally, I think it is uh, it might be a reasonable choice for this for the case of Afghanistan. It does send very complicated messages to uh, for the role of international criminal justice in general, because of course part of the violations committed in Afghanistan after 2002 have been committed by the United States, but also by other international actors and also by the former Afghan government. So only focusing on uh, the Taliban means that you do get, do sort of uh, let the, those that we want to define as the good guys off the hook. Um, um, Amelia, may I just add a couple of uh, words? Um, uh, and I agree with with Sari. Um, uh, firstly, I, I just add that um, victims have very high expectations of the ICC, um, not only in terms of um, uh, uh, crimes committed by the Taliban, but by um, any group. Um, uh, that that has uh, that is responsible, um, and going back beyond the jurisdiction before two thousand and three of of the ICC, as uh, uh, Torbjorn has has pointed out. So I think there is an issue here about um, uh, the expectations and rights of of victims, um, which because of the ICC's the prosecutor's focus recently announced um, uh, removes um, those uh, uh, expectations of many victims. But I wonder whether it has opened up more possibilities or more interest in universal jurisdiction. Um, and whether what might be seen in future are more uh, um, investigations and prosecutions at the national level um, uh, using uh, principles of, of, of universal jurisdiction. Um, it, it might be worth um, watching, watching that space. Um, so I just add, add in that point. Thanks. I'd be curious if Najiba or Tulbion have anything to add, especially on your comment, Richard, about um, the influence it may have on national processes. Uh, I was wondering if, if either of you had anything to, to add on this. No pressure. Uh, well, my reflection is very uh, um, far from the more legal uh, and Dealings, I think it would be politically unwise, basically, because of what Richard has said, the expectations, I mean, this would be seen as very biased 
to to uh, and and it might be the correct or not answer legally, but but I, I doubt it to be honest. Without being uh, legally trained myself, uh, why should you exclude many of the the uh, acts uh, uh, committed by by the other side, so to say? And um, and 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 I'm, but I'm more certain that it will be politically negative for any any future. Um, I do think I mean, I'm drawing more on that. My experience, I work quite a bit with Africa and with the African Union, and, and there are problems with, if I may say so, with the ICC or ICC's problem with them or whatever you want to say. But it it, it has, uh, it is a it's very difficult when when you perceive as taking sides and 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 uh, it, it's seen as taking the easy way out of, of, of. I think you would have the same debate in in Afghanistan. Thank you. Uh, Najiba, do you want to add anything to this? Or anything uh, else really? Not, but... <laughs> not really. <laughs> not really? Okay, no worries. Um, so I think we had a question from the first session that I think we didn't quite get to. Uh, and it was uh, about uh, your views on, uh, on the, the sort of political meeting held uh, in Norway and also later in Switzerland with, with the Taliban. And uh, we touched on it in the first session, but um, should these types of dialogue be encouraged in order to move forward in these issues concerning human rights? If anyone feels compelled to take this on, <laughs> it's a tricky one, but uh, I know we discussed it a little bit, but yeah. can, I, can I add? Mm -hmm. Of course. Um, I, I think, uh, um, I don't really understand the, such a such a discussions when when we don't um, when the we, when there is no willingness by the international communities uh, to to recognize uh, Taliban. Then, then there was also a lot of criticism by the human rights activists and also from the uh, uh, Afghanistan Afghanistan side. That's why uh, you, um, um, such such a legitimacy is given for the for the Taliban. Um, if if there is no willingness to um, uh, to recognize, so what does such uh, meetings um, um, would mean? So you might have heard the the, the critical questions uh, raised by. Kuriya Mustadik, one of the human rights uh, activists from Afghanistan, that um, that when a human rights or an ordinary people, when human rights are entering Europe, so they have to go through a very, very uh, a list of questions for a security check. But when Taliban enters uh, Europe, so the um, red carpets are are put on their a uh, way so they can they can they can enter Europe easily. So these kind of uh, criticism are there. So if uh, if um, um, there is no willingness or a prerequisite uh, um, conditions to recognize uh, before recognizing the, the, the Taliban, so what would mean inviting them and discussing? Uh, um, humanitarian crisis or whatever uh, with them. So if it is about helping the humanitarian, uh, providing humanitarian support, so it, it can, it can um, be done with the um, humanitarian organizations who are working in Afghanistan, UN, UNHCR, many other IC, ICCR or other uh, organizations in, in um, in Afghanistan, so why with the, with the Taliban? I, I personally, um, as a human rights activist, and I, I don't understand this this step. Um, so probably other other uh, friends here they they have another response, but for me, um, it is still um, a question. Uh, we already there are a lot uh, already a lot of criticism and there is there is already um, big questions for uh, uh, for people of Afghanistan and for human rights activists that when when United States entered into direct negotiation with 
with Taliban. So it was already recognizing them, recognizing them. So, um, so this is and inviting them in Europe and uh, discussing the issues with them. So this is also kind of giving them legitimacy. Uh, so why uh, such things are, are happening, and what is what is the political um, um, reason for that? Thanks, Najiba. Um, I wonder if Sari, Richard, Tulbion want to add anything. I, it's a, I thought it was a very thorough um, reflection from Najiba. Be curious to know what you think. Richard, please go ahead. Um Najiba has said what other human rights activists have said to me separately. So it's very consistent. Um, and I'd only add that um, I, I think people realize there's a need for, uh, for dialogue without recognition uh, to try and keep talking. But, you know, why? First of all, why fly people um, uh, in luxury to Europe for those discussions? Why can't they take place in Afghanistan? That's been one point that's been made uh, to me. And uh, second, um, how much consultation uh, was there with Afghan activists, civil society, before those meetings took place in Europe? Thanks, Richard. Sari Turbian, do you have any, any thoughts to add on this question? Sari, no, Turbian, no, okay. Um, so we're gonna wrap up in about 10 minutes. So we could uh, take one final question, but I, I'm also quite keen to just see if you have any general reflections based on the interventions of colleagues, if there's something that you thought at the beginning of this webinar that you now want to expand on or something like this, just to make sure that you all have a few minutes each to kind of unpack any concluding thoughts or the like. Sari, would you like to go first? Thank you very much. Um, yeah, what do you what do you say at the sort of at the end of a sort of this kind of seminar that has dealt with just uh, you know almost impossible questions to solve at uh, every level. And that has also uh, dealt with the, sort of the complex ways that international law interacts in the, the sort of political and practical, practical realities. I think uh, in a way, the last discussion around the meeting, the last question the, around the meeting is um, uh, in Oslo is, a good example of that. I mean, what we need to avoid is a situation where the international community, in a way, sleepwalks into a situation of recognizing the Taliban government. At the same time, we also need to avoid a situation where the international community, in a way, wishes that the now de facto Taliban government the way by ignoring its existence and findings the way ways around it to engage in Afghanistan and provide humanitarian and aid and development. And this for the moment, I think there's no good answer of how to move forward on this, but it definitely needs much more careful diplomatic engagement and people became becoming much more innovative in the political sphere. It also needs a uh, much more engagement, innovative in engagement with international law of actually finding the ways to make international law relevant in this issue of uh, how to deal with the Afghan government now and how to provide some form of answers for the people in Afghanistan. Richard mentioned one of them, 
which is sort of, okay, let's look at the ICC's engagement in Afghanistan, and let's look at how we, for example, can get the ICC also to engage on the Taliban's systematic uh, ex exclusion of women from society, basically, in Afghanistan. Thanks, Sari. Um, I thought your your point about calling for sort of uh, what was it? Uh, careful and innovative diplomatic engagement. It uh, immediately made me think of Tulbian, and I was wondering if uh, you Tulbian have any any sort of final comments that you've reflected on throughout the the webinar that you want to share as we begin to close. Thank you. No, uh, it is. I, I agree that the the um, the challenge is engaging without recognition, and that's the kind of main the first point. And how how on earth do you do that? I think one mustn't forget that it might be other players in the international community that holds the key than the ones we are used to talking to for the last twenty years. Uh, so I think maybe I would. Um, you know, uh, do a thorough analysis, possibly a difficult one, with the most likely most influential international community players in Afghanistan the coming couple of years. Uh, that that will be the diplomatic challenge that, that, that needs to be addressed by some way. It will be a difficult one because we know that, you know, with its shift in the multilateral uh, landscape. Some of those are not the friends you want to bring along, but but you, from a human rights perspective. But but I, I don't think there's another way to go because I, I think we we this. I, I like the term Sari said that we sleepwalking into. I mean now every government in Europe competes about who hates the Taliban's gender policies most, and and that's an easy competition because you know they're so terrible. But but you need to go beyond that and, and realize that whether we do it through our humanitarian commitment or some sense of responsibility, shared responsibility for what has happened and so forth, we might sleepwalk into something where human rights play a much uh, less significant role than it has done after all in, in our work the last 20 years. And, and in my view, the key is to talk to to the players that are most likely to be influential. I don't want to name <laughs> name countries, but I think you can all imagine what I think about. But that, 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 yeah. So that's my maybe final comment on on. You have to take a new approach. So. Thanks, Tobian. Um, I don't know if Najiba or Richard, who feels more compelled to go first, perhaps Niels as well. If, if if nobody wants to expand now, I have sort of a different question connecting to the teaching we've been doing the past couple of weeks here in Gothenburg. Um, and that connects to some of the points made, especially during the first session, I think, uh, where I think it was Sari uh, who discussed um, the erosion uh, of the prohibition of the use of force, which might have been the result of the Afghanistan case. And, and, and Richard, you also, I think, mentioned how we're seeing the end of liberal interventions. Um, do you see that uh, sort of the case of Afghanistan in this way may have not only eroded this principle, but also perhaps have enabled uh, more authoritarian regimes uh, to use the Afghanistan precedents as an argument for exercising, um, how should we put it, uh, not so liberal interventions. Uh, and uh, in that uh, context, I'm of course also thinking of the ongoing crisis in Ukraine. Um, perhaps it's a difficult question, but it would be interesting to hear what, what you guys have to uh, what, what your guys' take would be on that? If anyone's willing, if anyone dares 
to try to, to make a comment on that. Richard, would you? Uh, I'll dare, but I don't know um, what others will think. Uh, I haven't thought about this too much, but it does seem to me that um, Sari mentioned uh, the issue of sovereignty. Hmm. Um, and I think, I forget who said what now, I'm sorry, Sari, whether you mentioned R2P or Esan mentioned R2P, I can't quite remember, but the, the issue, the two concepts came up quite close together earlier in, in, in the, the discussion. And maybe it was you, uh, Niels, who asked about R2P. Um, uh, and, and so I don't know if you're uh, kind of getting at that, that, that um, a number of, uh, I mean, there's, there's, there's the issue of geopolitics, I think. Um, and the example you gave about Ukraine is, is probably an issue of that. And then there's the issue, and I'm not sure of the connection, I'm sure there are strong connections, the issue of authoritarianism. Um, and both resulting in a, um, uh, a uh, uh, apprehensiveness about um, intervention um, in, in any way on, grounds of, uh, often on grounds of national sovereignty. This is not the case so much in, uh, in Ukraine, of course, but uh, different, different issues in, in, in play there. But I do wonder about um, R2P because the discussions about R2P kind of climaxed around 2011 in Libya. Um, with the intervention there, and ever since then, um, it has been a you know it has gone kind of off the boil. It's not been a popular um, uh, subject, I think, um, except perhaps um, you know in theory. Um, but I wonder. I haven't really heard so much discussion about um, uh, that issue when it comes to Afghanistan. And when it comes, for example, um, to uh, the protection of women um, and women's rights in Afghanistan, do we, we don't seem to hear that. Maybe it happens, I don't hear much. Um, and, you know, what are the, um, uh, what are the factors that are preventing um, uh, a discussion about um, different forms of intervention. And by the way, R2, R2P has three, three pillars, of course, uh, and only the last pillar is, uh, is the use of force. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Sari or Turbjan or, or Najib, or would, you, would you like to step in here? I, I was also actually thinking of Libya because you know, my last, my last post was as ambassador to the African Union and, and Libya is obviously one of the more difficult issues there in the, in the relation between say the West and, 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 and the African Union and on how we interpreted that. And, and my take is that uh, the I mean, liberal interventions haven't been successful because they have expanded beyond R2P. They've been the war on terror, of course, which is the subject of what we're talking about, and maybe also what Nadiba said, it perceived as some kind of top-down approach to, to human rights or, or a specific interpretation of values and rights and, and so forth. So I think by, by not being very, by not using the R2P as the main reason of how we how we implement them, when we implement them, what legal grounds we use. I think we have lost, there's a risk. I don't see it as a big risk that the era of liberal interventions are, are coming to an end because they haven't been very successful. Uh, maybe Afghanistan is a place where they could have been successful in, in, compared to Iraq and, and Libya and others where, where they've been much less carefully uh, uh, implemented. But, but it is a pity if we, or, and I think a pity, I mean, it, it's, 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 uh, it's uh, a significant weakening of, of the international community in multilateral cooperation if we lose track of R2P. And how, how do we do that if we let it, so to say, die with, with uh, some not very thoughtful liberal interventions around the globe? 
and so I, yeah, that's that's my take. I, I don't think they have a, a future when it comes to the contamination. You know, to to you know authoritarian interventions. Maybe I, I don't see. Of course, I'm sure it's going to be used as as a as a reason for for that kind of intervention. But I don't think it will be very credible, to be honest. Sorry, do you want to say anything? Add anything here? If not, I'll I'll, I'll hand the word back to Emilia. Thanks. So, um, Tobian and Sari, you've already kind of given your concluding reflection. I just want to make sure that both Richard and Ajiba have a moment to say anything final, if they if they have anything final to reflect on. No reflection from my side. I would just like to reflect on something that Najiba said that has really stuck with me throughout the, uh, uh, the, the time since she said it. And it was a comment that you made, Najiba, regarding how young and sometimes educated young people are attracted to join the Taliban. And I found that a really interesting point. Uh, and you you kind of uh, almost at the same time showed that uh, striking image, which I also saw on social media a few days ago, of uh, the, the, the Taliban man in the bookshop um, with the old gun, but uh, reading a book. And I think that this comes up, you know, for me that the Taliban are consistently underestimated and probably misunderstood. Uh, I'm not in any way defending them. I don't want to do that. But I think that um, uh, sometimes why, you know, we need to ask those questions. Why are young men joining the Taliban? I'm from New Zealand. The spokesperson, the Taliban spokesperson for the Ministry of Foreign Affairs is a New Zealander. He went to university in New Zealand, like I did, and he's now gone back to Afghanistan and is the Taliban spokesperson. His brother is a researcher for the International Crisis Group, also a New Zealander. Interesting. Um, uh, I, uh, this, this, you know, it's not perhaps so relevant to the direction of the discussion, but Najiba, I was very, uh, uh, I was very struck by what you said. Thank you. Um. Thank you, Richard. It is so. Uh, it's really important. So I, I'm also not favoring uh, Taliban. So one thing is uh, should be clear that I'm not from coming from uh, Pashtun ethnicity. <laughs> so most of most of the times when you when you talk about something, so in Afghanistan, it is immediately people associate you with a with a with a, a group of um, uh, ethnicity in Afghanistan. So, but I'm. It is it is just for our discussions for uh, for our understanding that Taliban are human being, and we have to have a uh, a humanitarian perspective towards every everybody in Afghanistan. Doesn't matter is it Talib, is it Pashtun, it is Hazara, it is Uzbek, whatever. And um, yeah, the same. I all uh, sometimes I really really feel sympathy. With Taliban, especially those not, I, I'm not talking about the leadership of Taliban. It is a, it is something political. I, I really don't want to talk about that. But the ones who are, who are in a, really in a bottom, the ones who are playing, you you can see where they are. They are playing in the uh, office among themselves. They are they are playing in the in the uh, playgrounds. Uh, like uh, children, so I really, really feel uh, sympathy with them because because they they have never never experienced a childhood, so they grow up with a gun, with a hatred, and with a with a fight and all these things. So ignoring this parts of the the issues, I think is it is it really hard to deal with the with the. Um, um, development or uh, or progress uh, in Afghanistan. So that is why I, I, I really I really um, want so we, we, we should also have uh, this kind of pr perspectives when you're looking at the solving the issues uh, around the, uh, the Taliban in Afghanistan. 
Thank you, Najiba. Um, I think that's a good note to end on. So actually the time has come for, for me to say thank you and good and goodbye for this time. Uh, to Ehsan, Najiba, Sari, Tulbjorn, Richard, Niels, Marie and Jeff, thank you, thank you so much uh, for, for yet another um, very interesting seminar. You know, these lectures are they're, they're very uh, like double-edged sword because the reason they exist is, is awful. Um, but, or perhaps because of that, we, we want them to, to serve a purpose and to be useful. And I, I have to say that today's lectures felt very useful from my end. Um, and we have the commitment of you, our speakers, and the engagement of you, our audience, to thank for that. And so we're, we're very grateful. Um, and we hope uh, that all of you found it useful too. We are most appreciative of you all being here, and we hope you keep talking. So take care. Thank you. Thank you very much, Emilia. Thank you, everyone. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you, everyone.